Okay, everybody, welcome to the June 13, 2019 regular board meeting of the Santa Barbara Community College District Board of Trustees. Um, and I'll ask everyone who wishes to participate to uh, uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, and for the record, I'll note that uh, all of the trustees are present this evening. Angie, do we have any speaker slips? No, I don't. You're sure about that? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a first, I think. Um, so our next item on the agenda is item 4.1 uh, for <coughs> consideration and approval of the minutes for the meeting of May 9th, 2018. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Good afternoon, Luz. Hello. We're now going to have a presentation on our updated website from uh, Luz Reyes Martin. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Board President Miller and members of the Board of Trustees. I'm Luz Reyes Martin. I'm Executive Director of Public Affairs and Communications. I'm so thrilled to be here this evening to talk to you about the website redesign project and where we are. Um, so I'm going to start by very quickly talking about why we are doing this. <laughs> so our current site has been in its uh, state as it is now for over 10 years, which is quite a long time without having kind of a refresh or an overhaul of the website. Um, when we started this project, we you know, worked with a consultant whose expertise is specifically with community colleges, which was really great insight. Uh, we have 13,000 total files on the site um, with over 4,500 pages. Um, and to give you an idea of the work that's been uh, invested in this project, the planning team and I, at the beginning of this project, sat in a conference room over the course of two whole days and went through each one of those 4,700 pages uh, to determine if it was information or content that needed to be updated, if it was a page we needed, if it needed to be consolidated with another page, or if it was obsolete. Um, more often than not, it was outdated information that uh, could be archived or moved somewhere else. So the goals of the redesign, um, it's really important to uh, make clear that the intent is really around design and functionality. Content is something that's going to be an ongoing process. Um, we really wanted to have our website be student-centered, to be a resource for faculty, staff, and the community uh, to have an updated modern design, to be, have more functionality, um, to be really cohesive on the SBCC image and brand, and responsive design was a huge goal. And what I mean by that is our current site is not uh, as accessible on a mobile device or on a tablet. Um, so that was a big, big part of this project, was to have a website that, as we all are, have come to expect with websites, that they be easy to navigate on any type of device. We know from our data that a really large portion of um, visitors to our website are accessing it from a mobile device. Um, so we are losing a lot of uh, people who want to learn more about our college because the mobile version of our website's not as easy uh, to navigate. And so what that means in terms of why this has taken a long time 
is when you're designing or doing an overhaul of a design, you have to design for three different sizes. You have to design for the desktop view, for a tablet, and for mobile. And those are very different, so with every piece of this project, we had to constantly be thinking of really three different designs and how they'd all work together. Consolidation of redundant information. Um, adherence to accessibility standards was a, a real primary focus. Um, and one of the reasons why our consultant, which is uh, a firm called iFactory, was so strong is um, that they have a lot of expertise with um, accessible design. Um, in fact, I think one of the projects they talked about was the website for the Helen Keller uh, College, um, which was a really unique project to uh, design a website for that audience. Um, having accurate and consistent information and a unified web presence. And what I mean by the unified web presence is what has happened over the years is we've had departments or programs that are very eager and dedicated and will create their own website uh, for their program. Um, and we have supported that. We understand they had needs uh, for better functionality. And so now with this new design, we're going to bring them all back in uh, underneath the large, the overall SBCC umbrella. So we're in the process of doing that right now. So we don't have any more of those rogue kind of sites. So a little recap of the work that we've done since about the spring of 2017 to now. As I mentioned, we completed a full inventory. We looked at the site map, um, which is you know, the page hierarchy for the whole site. We had uh, two large campus forums where we gave updates and got feedback. We had um, a survey that also allowed people to provide feedback. We did a lot of focus groups early on with different employee groups and with students to learn more about how they interacted with the website, what things were challenges, what they liked. Um, in particular, the student focus groups were really, really valuable. We heard very clearly from students of all ages and from different uh, backgrounds how they view the site, um, how they interact with other similar websites, why they chose to come to City College, and what things were barriers. Um, so that really informed a lot of our design. We heard a lot of the, I can't really look at it on my, on my phone. Um, that was a big uh, barrier for students. Um, we did a lot of different design explorations. I think what was really great was there were many other community colleges in California that were also going through this process. Uh, so we were able to kind of share some of that information and talk to each other about, what are you doing? Have you figured out how to do this one thing? Um, so over the last year or two, we've seen a lot of other colleges um, debut their new websites as well. We work with Omni Update, which is our uh, content management system. It's the back end. Um, so they've been part of this process all along to make sure that that functionality remains. And they have been a partner with doing all the training that will be required uh, for all our web editors campus wide to work within the new design templates. Um, I mentioned content responsive design. And I want to give a special acknowledgment to the rest of the people that have been really, really integral to this process. We had a planning team um, that has included representation from IT, of course, from educational programs, from my office in the Office of Communications, from student services, and from faculty. And concurrently with the work we've been doing with the consultant on the web design, uh, members from my office, and they're here today, um, Amanda Jacob, Sally Gill, and Kirsten Matheson, um, and our webmaster, who I'll talk about in a second, have been, over the last year and a half, uh, completely updating our inventory of photography and of videos. So every single photo or image that you'll see on our new website is of real students or real staff. There are no stock photos anywhere, which was a big priority for us. We wanted to show who we really are 
Um, and so that was in a, a project that has just been ongoing uh, when working with some really talented student photographers. Um, so that's been really wonderful. Um, and we've been working both with students and with a uh, private company to do some videos. And I'll be able to share two of those today. Uh, but we've uh, been doing a lot of video t of student testimonials, faculty testimonials, some kind of just overall uh, videos about the college that will be sprinkled in throughout the website. We've also developed new uh, web content and design guidelines um, to help our web editors um, give them some guidance on how to keep the content on their pages fresh or updated and we're of course a resource for them um, and also our brand and style guidelines and what I mean by that is things like how do you use the logo, what's appropriate uh, use of the logo, what's our color palette, what are our fonts, um, things that are very near and dear to the people in my office, <laughs> but it's all helpful guidance for, for those uh, people on campus who are creating a new web page for their department or for their program. So we were moving along in about this time last summer when uh, two of our most critical uh, people in IT um, got great opportunities to go to other colleges and they both left within the same you know, week and a half. So a lot of the work came to a little bit of a halt. We were able to focus on other aspects of the project, but we had hoped to launch the new website in January of this year. Um, so we had to wait a little bit to be able to rehire um, really our webmaster, <laughs> that was a big critical uh, staff member. Um, so we were able to hire Hong Lu, and I'm including him here because he came over to us from the city of Santa Barbara's library, and he hit the ground running. Um, he is our webmaster, he's in the Office of Communications with my team, and since he arrived, he has been meeting constantly with, uh, we have about 125 web editors throughout the campus. Those are people who are responsible for their uh, pages, uh, for their program or department. He has individual meetings. He makes himself completely available to anybody on campus to provide training or support with the new design. Um, our whole team in the Office of Communications has weekly uh, meetings to go through um, things that still need to be done to be able to go live um, and he's also coordinating with the Faculty Resource Center to provide ongoing uh, training for anyone uh, or support uh, on the new website and he's been working really closely with our consultants. So I want to be able to share a little sneak peek. So first I'm going to show you what the home page looks like. Um, so we'll have the capability to have scrolling um, images that are clickable. Um, we chose to put students at the center as much as possible of every part of the website. So you'll see these four students are, uh, you know, some of our actual students. Um, and each one of those we can rotate out to do different things. Um, and when you click on them, you'll see a little video testimonial from the students. So I'm going to share one of them of Isabel. Hi, my name is Susan. Classes are small and where I have direct contact with the faculty. Since my first semester, I found many resources on campus to help me succeed. I found help through academic counseling, tutoring, scholarships, and a flexible on-site job as a math tutor. Thanks to the continuous support that my professors and the school has provided me, I was able to land a semester-long internship at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, where I had real hands-on experience. I would say that this college has definitely helped me prepare for my future career as an engineer. I think of SVCC as my home because apart from giving me an excellent education, I feel like I am part of a strong and diverse community where people take care of each other and their main goal is to help you succeed. I also feel extremely lucky to be living in such a beautiful place like Santa Barbara. And we have students from all different disciplines. We have some older adult students that we'll be highlighting. And we also have a lot of faculty videos. I'd love to just spend an hour to show you all the videos. But um, once the website is live, you'll be able to go explore um, and see all of them. 
So before we could click play, we spent a lot of time with enrollment services and with student services to really make sure that part of our website was really, uh, you know, very student friendly, information was clear, students knew exactly what the steps to enrollment would be, and they had a really good idea about the academic uh, programs and support that prospective students would have here. Um, so this is a video that's only a minute long, but um, it, we're really proud of doing this like one minute snapshot of um, our college. And again, those are all actual students. Um, and a big thank you to Professor Katie Laris in the theater department for working with us and offering some of her students. But a lot of them are just students that we've worked with in our office um, that were just so excited and eager to be part of a project like this. So you'll see um, some of the pages have uh, this type of functionality where we're organizing the information in a really easy, a uh, way for students um, to, you know, navigate. Um, School of Extended Learning has also done a really great job. Um, we have a lot of great videos in School of Extended Learning as well that you'll see. And so what are our next steps? Um, we are in the process right now of making sure the website is in a place where we can now share it uh, more widely internally across the campus. So we'll have a, a test site or a development site that will be available internally for a couple of weeks. We're gonna ask people around campus to you know, go explore. We'll have a form where they can fill out, like I found this thing that needs to be corrected or this glitch. Um, so we'll have that time for them. Um, and then my team uh, with Hong and our, our webmaster will spend some time going through each of those and fixing all those things. Um, in time for what we're planning for a public launch in early August. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention about the videos is you notice that the ones that have audio are all captioned. We've also had them all captioned in English and in Spanish. Um, and we hope to continue to do more of that into the future. So uh, our current site will remain available internally during a transition period. It took us well over 10 years to get to the point where we are now. We know it's not gonna be like, you know, flicking a switch and everything's gonna be perfect. We know we're gonna have a period of transition where we're gonna need to tweak things or where it might be, um, it'll be a process for people to get used to the new navigation. So we will have the current site still available for some time until we're able to, you know, completely turn that part off. Um, we'll provide regular training and support for people on campus who are responsible for keeping their pages updated. Um, we'll have dedicated pages on the website that will explain what the process was for this new design and provide an opportunity for people, even in the community, to submit, um, you know, they found a bug or some kind of, they want to report something that might be, or a broken link or something like that. Um, and some of the ongoing work that we'll be doing, um, we have some design tweaks that we're gonna be making, and then another big part is guided pathways. So when we started this, we were also starting as one of the pilot programs for guided pathways, pilot colleges. And so we left that part of the website. Um, we didn't do like a whole comprehensive redesign because we didn't know exactly where we would be with guided pathways. So now we're at a point where uh, in working with Margaret Prothero and the guided pathways team, now we're gonna bring that part online over the next couple of months. We'll be designing out those pages where we'll guide students to um, 
you know, academic and career pathways, and we're working on those pathway, uh, program mapping. Uh, so we'll be working on those pages over the next couple of months, um, which is also really exciting and will just complement um, this project. Um, so that's my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. For Lou, that was fantastic. Wow. I, I mean, I can't wait to see it when it's, when it's up. You know, in this digital age that we've been in now for some time, and it becomes increasingly important that you have a web page that functions really well, because that's our face to prospective students, and it's our face to the community. And I know I hear people, uh, if, if they, they're going to some business or some institution or something and they want to find out information, if that website doesn't look good, doesn't yeah. function right, it's an immediate negative uh, uh, stain on whatever that, uh, whatever that business or institution or school is. So thank you. That was a great presentation. Any, anybody have questions or comments? Yeah. Jonathan. I echo everything Robert said. That's very true. Uh, a bad website can ruin your reputation almost. It, or it looks bad. It looks bad. And I actually just had someone this week trying to sign up for classes, and they had a tough time you know, just figuring it out. And I was able to show them this. I was like, hey, don't worry. We're on it. <laughs> uh, and they, they saw the pictures, and they're like, that looks better. It looks like I can use that easier. But I have a, just one question. How many pages are we at now if we were at 4,700? Oh, you, you know, know and, and Hong couldn't be here tonight, okay. but it's it's reduced. Way less it's, I mean, we still there's still a great deal of information we yeah. need to have, um, but a lot of the reduction really was in pages that are obsolete. Okay. Um, so it was a lot of cleanup that needed to happen. And I did want to mention that we we did pay particular attention to our community. So when, once you're able to kind of navigate the site, we have a whole section that's really for our community. So it's going to make it a lot easier for members of the community to find um, events of interest, for example, through our theater group or other of uh, the events and calendar kind of feature is going to be vastly improved. Um, or things like facilities, rentals, um, so and the foundation, of course. Um, so we have a lot of community resources that um, will be easy for members of the community to find. Is the site homegrown, or is it a vendor that? The design yeah. was with a consultant, okay. yes. Okay. Thanks. I'm looking forward to this, too, and it's looking great as it comes along. Um, I had Mr. Liu, I had a, a maker workshop with him at Santa Barbara Central a couple oh, of years ago, so I, I thought it was great when he came on board here. Um, my questions, comments are, I, um, in terms of the board's page, I just want to be sure that the archives and minutes back to 1959 are still going to be there. None of that information is going anywhere. Yes, it and, will be there. Um, and then the searchability of the website matters a lot. Um, yes. And so I just want to be sure that there are good limiters, that there are ways to you know, really narrow a search down. Yes, and we're working really closely with um, the vendors that we need to to make mm -hmm. sure that that functionality is Great. still there. And then my last question is, I've always actually kind of found us hard to find on the web because we're under college departments, which I don't really think of us as a department. Um, and I was wondering if that's going to change. It will be much easier to find the Board of <laughs> Trustees. Mm -hmm. um, you'll be front and center in the you know kind of about us, which is Makes a lot very more similar sense. to how other colleges have it um, yeah. have it set up. And one thing that you know, because you mentioned that, there's a new state law that requires. Um, Brown Act bodies to make a direct link to your agendas um, one click from your homepage. Um, so every community college, you know, because those are my peers, have been doing this a little bit differently. Um, so what we have done is you'll see um, this icon here says public meetings because we have several Brown Act uh, bodies here. So that will be a direct link to board docs. Um, and we'll also be able to have, um, there's an announcements kind of portion of the home page where we'll, we can put like when there's a board meeting or something like that. Great. But it will be in several different places much easier to find. Great. Thanks, Luz. Marcia. Um, thank you for all this work. I really appreciate it. I think the website will be so much better, <laughs> so much better. I wish we'd been a focus group. Um, you probably thought we don't use the website, but, <laughs> but I certainly do. And um, like Kate, I'm concerned about a couple of things. One is 
what happens with those existing documents? Can I go find that archive and search it? Because I frankly look at a whole range of documents when I'm searching for something. The search function isn't great, but you do turn up things that are relevant and they are old um, in some cases. You should still be able to find everything on the site. Uh, the only things that we've removed are things that are either duplicate files or um, I, we had some web pages that had um, like committee information, membership from 12 years ago um, that we didn't, doesn't need to be on the website. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you as we uh, ha launch the internal site. Um, if there's something you can't find, um, I can help you with that. No, that would be really helpful because I find some of these documents very helpful in understanding how an issue would develop within the college and was discussed. Yeah, Things and we like did that. talk about that, like wanting to have information still available. Mm -hmm. And I think what we came kept coming back to is that information is really uh, important to have, but it doesn't need to be on the website. The website is really, we. I, so many of our student focus groups talked about going down like a rabbit hole of clicks and finding something that was really confusing for them um, or unexpected to find on a public website. Um, so a lot of that information, we're talking to IT about making you know, pipeline more robust, for example, for employees and for the board, or other ways to archive information that's not on the website. But I would think they were also public documents, so. Yeah, and so. they'll still be uh, available as public documents. Okay. Um, the, I was glad to hear you said there's going to be a special aspect of the website for the community as a resource because when I looked at your example, we had resources for faculty and staff, um, and I was thinking students, community, you know, all those groups, yeah. of course, need inclusion. Um, the SEL list, which we have right up here, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing the state-supported classes there? It's just because it's way? cut off. I just gave you a little. Um, so like they're right below? It scrolls down, yeah. Okay. That they're would, all there, yes. That would be something I think our community <laughs> wants to know about. No, easily. and Dr. Moreno and her team have done a really great job of making those pages really robust. Okay, and then the last thought I had was um, the I'm sensitive to some of the issues that came up during our 2014 bond effort. Mm -hmm. And one of those was, what is the college telling students about itself, about what it is? Who, who are they looking for? And the thing that was triggering that was a lot of pictures and videos that related to the beach and the environment rather than the academic programs. So, you know, when I look at these pictures, I look at that, them with some of that concern. For example, the one with School of Extended Learning that you have up there, mm -hmm. you know, very classroom. The first one, summer school, not so much. I mean, it's more. Um, I think there's one. students yeah. studying on our West Campus yeah. lawn. And the ocean in the background and all of that. So you have a tendency to be looking at that as something we're selling. And so that's a concern I have in terms of, I, I'm not looking at the whole website. I'm not seeing what the overall impact of that will be. But I would just say that's, yeah. I think, an important thing. There is thing. a balance throughout the website of classroom, library, you know, academic uh, photographs. Um, this is not a staged photograph. This was actual students out there studying. Mm -hmm. um, so we did want to capture the reality of student life as well. And that was something we heard really loud and clear from the student focus groups was they wanted to see themselves, they wanted to see you know, typical daily activities um, that they would uh, expect as a student. And that makes sense. I mean, I, I agree with that. I'm just saying I think it's a, it's a, can be a difficult issue at times. Peter, did you have yeah, something? No, I, I wanted to echo what what our president said, just, I was trying to think of a word beyond superb, but I couldn't. Um, but, you know, just looking at it, I had the feeling of, you know, how do I, how do I sign up? Um, and uh, and I have not... extended learning classes for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, and, and I'm not so much bothered by shots. I, didn't, I mean, I think there is a balance. I, I think the balance for me was achieved with the interview of the student who yeah. clearly brought forward the academic component. You know, she's, that's, she's if very I was impressive. looking at that, I'd be thinking that that's a serious student. I, I want to be that student. And, and at least I'd, I'd hope I would think that way. My, my concern or question, frankly, is you know, in bringing all of the other websites under the same umbrella, did that pose something of a, of a diplomatic challenge for you? At first, because there was some skepticism about whether they would still be able to have the functionality that they're used to from, say, a WordPress site or some other you know, kind mm -hmm. of easy vendors. But once they saw the actual templates, we've had really great response with um, m all, all of them wanting to come on board um, and knowing that they have the support of our office, whether they need updated photography, you know, whether they want to, a video of their program or the support from our webmaster on the technical side, um, we're really now their kind of one-stop shop to help them uh, through that process. And there's so many reasons for them to come on board. Mm -hmm. They have better security. We can ensure that their websites are meeting our required accessibility standards. Um, so we've not run into that problem yet, um, but uh, we're gonna keep tackling them one at a time. Now, will they be responsible, will the faculty departments, for example, be responsible for updating their own pages, or how will that work? So the way it works right now is um, each academic department has a designated web editor. Um, that's how we've done it for even before this process. So we've been working with those web editors, as I mentioned, there's about 125 of them um, to help them kind of fix their content. And it really varies. Some departments really like to have uh, very fresh content that changes with new photographs, um, and some have more static information. So we're meeting them where they are um, and helping them uh, through that transition. Yeah. Well, great, great job. Thank you very much. It's absolutely been a team effort, and a lot of people have been involved in getting us to where we are now. Thank you, Liz. I used to take a nap on the West Campus, just <laughs> like that student up there, because I spent many hours here, something from 7 to 9 p.m. at night. Um, so yeah, I'm like Peter. I was like, wow, I want to go back <laughs> to take a nap on that <laughs> West Campus. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, Peter stole my, my, my only real question I had. Um, he got a great answer, and so for that, I thank Peter and, your, and you. Um, I had one little thing remaining that somebody, nobody else brought, brought up yet, and that is <clears throat> I get uh, in my contacts with my constituency and the public, um, I frequently get asked, uh, am I in your district, your, your mm -hmm. area, or am I not? And when I look at the maps available on our website, there's areas where you can't tell where that line really is. And, I'm, and uh, yet the maps are available, like you can really get the maps. Can we, if you didn't already, could you please do something about the maps so people could actually read them so they could tell which area they're, they're or how, where are, how we divide it? Yeah, now, I'd be happy I would to just, look at just that. Just a request. Yeah. Get different maps. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. That's a good idea. Kenny. Uh, I just want to thank you because in when I, when I was coming here, the website was, I was like, why is the website looking so small? But this is really great. I just want to thank you on behalf of all the students because we are always complaining about the website. Yes, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but this is, this is wonderful and we really love it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Thank you. So now we're going to move to agenda item 5.2, the draft 2021 to 25 five-year capital outlay plan and funding options uh, presentation. I think the first part of that is familiar to us. I think there's some um, updated uh, numbers, but I'm also excited to hear about funding options, which is not something we've talked about much. It looks like uh, Lindsay is first up. Over here in the afternoon, it's always the evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> President Miller, Board of Trustees, and President uh, Benjamin. So as you're aware, we have had this 
kind of looming out there to discuss. We had our special board meeting back in April where we talked about this the first time, the draft five-year capital outlay plan, and we did have it on the agenda to discuss in May, and I had attached this document to that agenda. However, I have made a couple minor changes to it since then as things continue to change, and I wanted to provide a little bit clearer format for you based on some conversations I'd had that will hopefully help with our discussion today. Today is a little bit of a two-part discussion. I'm going to talk about this briefly. We have already talked about a lot of it. There are not a lot of changes, so I won't spend a whole lot of time going through this actual document. After that, we have some guests here to discuss funding options, so I'll introduce those when I'm done. <clears throat> oh, she said I could drive this. Let's see here. Ooh, that went too fast. Okay. So I'm not going to read this to you, but this section is of most importance, the local funding sources. This is what our guests are going to be talking to us about this evening, these different options that we have available to California Community Colleges to uh, supply us funding for the portion of the capital outlay projects that we're presenting in the five-year capital outlay plan as options for local funding abilities for us for the swing space needs and then the local contribution for the various projects that we have in that draft plan at this point in time. So we'll be going through that in more detail, and that's just a uh, kind of general description for everyone about those options. Okay. So the physical education building, we keep talking about it, and it's, it's a little bit in the, in the wrong place right now because it's not actually going to be in our 1925-year capital outlay plan because it was in last year's but I want to keep doing the refresher of what the status is with that building and that project and the funding of it. So our physical education building, we had requested a, the final project proposal in last year's five-year capital outlay plan, and it was approved through the Board of Governors. That project is a modernization project entirely replacing, sorry, it's a replacement project where we're replacing the entire building, tearing down the entire PE building, and replacing it with an entire new building, same size, shifted over a little bit closer to the bridge in a, in a similar location. So that was approved through the Board of Governors last year through the typical process. And in January, just six months ago now, the um, Department of Finance came back to us and said, well, that project doesn't have a local contribution, and we're looking for projects to have local contributions at this time, even though through the normal process it's not required. So this has been a change with the student-centered funding formula. We've been experiencing those funding changes. And as I've mentioned, we're also experiencing these changes in the funding for the capital outlay projects. So when they came to us in January, they said, hey, you know, would your district be interested in supplying a local contribution? And at the time, we said, look, you know, we can't get back to you in five days with information um, you know, of how much more we could, we could uh, supply. And so we're leaving our plan the way it's been. Please carry forward. And that has happened. We've gone through this process where now, through the May revise and the budget process at the state level, there's 29 projects that this occurred with. We were not the only one. There were 29 different schools with 29 different projects of varying types that the Department of Finance removed from the Board of Governors approved plan for 1819. So ours was just one of 29, so there was a lot of momentum across the state to please ask the governor to put those projects back in the budget because they had been approved. And right now, we're like on pins and needles, right now we're in the very final stages of that process at the state level with the budget. As we know, the budget is, will be finalized by Saturday. I was really hoping to have a firm answer today for all of us on exactly what's the final piece with this project and where we're at. I do have an unofficial update of what, where our project is at in the budgeting process. The unofficial update that I received yesterday and then clarification again on today is that our project is included along with the all 29 projects. They've all been re-included back into the budget through the conference committee. And that was the, the great news at the end of last week. Oh, it's all been re-included the same way it was with 0% local contribution, give or take, from Santa Barbara City College. So I was really excited at the end of last week and then just yesterday and then today I received clarification that the um, conference committee has approved our project. It's in the queue, but they've reduced the dollar amount that they'll be providing for the budget. So in essence, instead of coming back to us and asking us to do a local contribution, they're just saying, 
we're only going to fund about 80% of the project, so you're going to have to contribute about 20%. So just kind of a, a different way for them to present it back to us. Instead of asking, they're just telling us, yes, you're still in the budget, but at an 80% level instead of 100% level. So what that changes in, in these numbers that I'd put together previously is the $4 million 10% local contribution is basically a 20% contribution of $8 million for this project. But this is unofficial, could still change between now and tomorrow, could go back the other way, could be a completely different scenario, but I at least wanted to share what I know right now and hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow we'll have a, a final result of what the state budget will be including for our PE project. So I think it's some really great news that they still are including in the project funding of about $31 million to the district for that project. So that's the update on that one. The other information here really hasn't changed at all. I'll kind of um, skim through it, but the student services building, remember with our five-year capital outlay plan, we have to complete this plan by the summer of each year. So we're in that process. Student services we've been talking about for many years. We had previously submitted the initial project proposal and it was approved for us to submit a final project proposal this year. So we're slated to do that. That's what we've been working on for the last couple months, getting all the um, information available, ready, all the um, reports ready to complete this final project proposal for the student services building. That project would be a modernization. We would leave the building the way it is, the, especially the outside of it, it would look the same to those of us on the outside, and the inside would be modernized and remodeled to help with the flow of our students and our programs. We want to integrate some of our portables that have been scattered around campus that have programs in them that really belong in the student services building into that building, and that's a part of this plan that we would be adding additional programs into the space using assignable square footage that is not well used right now because of like large corridors, big posts in the middle of the room, you know, the building was uh, built as a library. So it needs to be completely remodeled inside so we can add more programs in it and have a better flow that'll help with the guided pathways and with when new students arrive on campus, they know where to go and they can get the services they need. So it's a project that the district's been very excited about for, for a while, knowing we wanna um, improve in those areas. So this one is slated for the end of the process here. The funds that we're asking for for the student services building, this is the last step. Once we commit to this Fiverr capital outlay plan and the FPP on student services, we would be committing to that plan. And as I shared previously, the um, Department of Finance and the Chancellor's Office have, has been working together to change the legislation for the um, metrics and the rules that are used to obtain the funding, and now we're looking at a requirement of a 25% local contribution by districts. So I have that built into the plan. Even though it's still in transition, we're building it in now knowing that's what they're gonna be looking for, okay? Then the next one that we have in our plan, this one is the um, Peter McDougall administration and we're working on the renaming of the career education buildings. We've been calling it occupational education, which is kind of a, an outdated term now. So you'll see this newer title here in this document we're working towards. This particular building, we would like to include um, a request from the state for funding to modernize the administration building. It's a 100-year-old building really in need of some new um, new infrastructure inside of it. Think pipes, electrical, plumbing, things of the, that nature. Of course, we love the historic look and feel of this building, so architecturally, that would remain the same. But we're requesting to do a, a infrastructure modernization of the building, because it's quite old and failing, and in terms of uh, the plumbing and electrical and IT equipment, all of that, we really could um, use the modernization in that area. It would also assist us with our ongoing emergency repair costs that we're experiencing right now, where it's costing us quite a bit of money to keep the, keep the building operating. So this would be an initial project proposal. It's the first step. You have to request that first, and then you would get approval to request the FPP. So at this point, we're not obligated to go forward next year and do the FPP if for some reason we change our mind. This is just the first step. We're not solidifying that we would do this project at this point in time, but you have to do step one to get to step two. So that is that one. We have a few other buildings that we would like to list as needs for um, 
funding in the future, the physical science building, the Wake Campus and the portable classrooms there, the Children's Center and the Shot Campus and the portables there. The reason for including those on the five-year cap Lattley plan at this time is to provide the state with the information that funding needs exist. They use this across the state to collect all the information from the various colleges so they have an idea of knowing what a statewide bond should look like, how much money um, is needed by all the different colleges out across the state to help with the uh, facilities needs. So we're not asking for anything in particular at this time on those. It's just to provide that information to the, to the state. So that's why those are on there. And we haven't had those on there in the past, in the last two years. So this is the new page that I just added recently to try and give us a, a rough estimate. Some of these are very rough estimates. The swing space dollar amounts here are just very rough estimates. The local funding amounts are, are more precise in terms of how much we would be required to contribute to the uh, funding we would receive from the state. So you can see we kind of have, we have two costs for each of these buildings, each of these projects we have. The local contribution we need to make for the project overall and then the swing space for each one. So you can see that if you add up the total of all the local funding needs for these three projects, which keep in mind are, are all staged very far out, these would not be occurring at the same time at all, um, but that would be $33 million plus another $4 million if what I just described with the PE building does take place where we need to contribute an additional 10% basically. But then the other column I want to point out is the state funding piece. We're looking at receiving $88 million from the state to build these particular buildings, remodel them or modernize them, depending on the case or place them. So those are the pieces that are important to understand for the state funding that we would be receiving pretty, very substantial amounts of funding from the state that would be really, really beneficial to the district in these projects. to take a deep breath, I realized I was talking very fast. I think I made it through it all. Is there anything else? Any questions at this time before I pass it on to our guests? Yeah. Just a clarifying question. So if I did the math, if I did the math right, if the FPPs for the student services and physical education, those are the, those lock us in, not the McDougal one. So including swing space and our match, that's $16 million we would owe if we approve this. So you've got? I did 4.1 plus 5 plus 4.5 plus 3. And probably add another 8. 4 million 2. for PE because it, based on the information I know today, that number would double. The so 4.1 would double. 20 million is what we would it. be committing to if we approve this. Let me clarify a little bit further. The PE building we already committed to last year. Okay. So that one we're already committed to. We did the FPP for that one. The PE building is a very unusual situation where it's been, it was pulled out mid-year after it was approved. That's not the normal five-year capital outlay plan process. Usually once it's approved, it's approved and it goes through. So you usually only are gonna have one FPP for year, per year per site. In fact, that's the part of the regulations is you can only request funding at that final stage, one site per project per year. Okay. <coughs> Kate. Um, just looking at this last page here, so swing space, um, that's just temporary housing for whatever mm. programs going on. Mm -hmm. um, is that, um, it doesn't just go away when you're done. I mean, I'm looking at the, the, the costs for swing space and is that a, a long-term permanent improvement for something else? How does that work? It's a great question. So the complexity and amount of swing space projects we would need to do for all of these different projects is really going to entail an, an entire study of its own. We had a um, plan that we will need to kind of duplicate in the past about using portables, eliminating portables after you are done with them. It's going to take a whole master plan, a whole master swing space plan. And we haven't gone into um, using any funds to determine that at this point in time is it's too early. We don't want to, you know, use dollars for something we haven't even gotten uh, down the line yet with. But it'll be a whole plan, and I'm sure it would include the use of portables. They would come in, go out, or maybe the use of different buildings as, you know, as things shift. So it's, it would be a whole, a whole project to figure that out with some experts would help us do that. Marcia? Um, 
So do we know what uh, has happened with the shortfall in revenue from um, the uh, student-centered funding, the $49 million, I think it was? Has you, that been covered for this year? You're talking about for the budget overall? Right. Um, let's go through all of that tomorrow when we're at the retreat all the budget information, because the student-centered funding can't, formula I is. I can't hear that. You, you couldn't Sorry. hear me? Hmm? You couldn't hear me? Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah, tomorrow we're gonna go through all the budget information with our new fiscal projections and the new budget. So we'll go through all the budget information tomorrow. Hopefully but, we'll get but through. But is there all. a yes or no on whether that's covered? The 49, what? The 49 million for this year was, um, as I understood it, the amount that um, the student-centered funding formula overshot what the state had in its funding for the colleges, and therefore they were looking at a possible um, deficit reduction in yeah. what we got. Yes, a part of that did go through. Yeah, I don't, remember, that, I don't recall being exactly 49 million. Yeah, I don't know. Well, whatever that was, it was a couple million for us. For us. Yes. And is yeah. that now covered? We're not gonna get? No, it is not all covered. <laughs> not all it's no. not covered. Mm -mm. Not all. So we're going to be two million less in revenue for this fiscal year. Oh, you, oh, I remember what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, okay. for this year. Mm -hmm. And that's on top of our projected eight million operating deficit. Deficit. The eight million is the was the projection for next year, not for this year. Okay, but it's still a an additional deficit. Mm -hmm. Yes, for this okay. year. Yeah. And then in addition to that, there was a proposal to spend two and a half million out of construction fund, the campus center set aside, mm -hmm. for redoing our fields and tracks and moving HR and upgrading some classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yes, in our 1920 budget that we'll be going through tomorrow, we have specific projects that we've included in the construction budget. And the two projects are the projects that you've listed off. $2 million to replace the turf, not the track, it's just the turf. Okay, turf. And then a half million dollars for classroom improvements that, that are greatly in need, as well as an HR office move. So we'll go through that tomorrow when we look at the construction fund and those projects. Okay. But yes, So that's the reason correct. I'm asking here is that the more I look at our operating deficit and the more I look at the other elements floating around, like the two million not, that we may not get for mm -hmm. this fiscal year, the mm -hmm. two and a half million for the field and the um, HR and so forth. I mean, we have less and less funding to deal with any of these projects. Mm -hmm. And they're asking us to take more funding for PE, which means to me that we had a deal and they broke the deal and want to redo the deal. So I don't look at us as being committed either way because the original agreement apparently has, is no longer. Um, and we have what, if my math is right, and that doesn't even count the, the two million shortage, uh, for this fiscal year, if my math is right, our, our construction set aside for campus center is down to seven and a half million. Ten. So we're looking at a PE project that would cost um, 13.2 million plus swing space isn't the only thing that's not covered. Mm -hmm. um, parking spaces, equipment, all the interior equipment stuff, uh, the landscaping. We paid roughly 40% over Chancellor's Office budget for our oversight people who are really good, mm -hmm. but that is unlikely to be covered by the Chancellor's Office. So all of those things easily, I would think, could be another million, which means we're looking at a set aside of seven and a half million for PE and 14.2 million in expenses that we're being asked to commit to, uh, recommit to, because as I said, they sort of back, they backed out. I'm, at this point, it's imaginary money. So I'm looking forward to the presentation on where we might find some of that money, um, but I am certainly deeply concerned that we can't afford it. You did a great segue into our guests and why they're here. Any more questions on this, though, before I introduce them? I just had a question on the portables for the wake and the shot. So we, those were never portables that we were asked to remove, so they're just no. going to be renovated to be nicer and 
or sorry, replaced, like completely new ones? Um, actually, what the idea we have for Wake and Shot is the same for both locations, where we would remove the portables. Portables are not a, a you know, long-term great mm -hmm. learning environment, and replace them with buildings. Oh, good. Yeah. At Wake, we had a really great uh, facilities master plan forum right. and ha received wonderful input from the community members there. They're very interested in maintaining the 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 front of the building, right? Mm -hmm. The whole the whole campus, not the portables, but the current yeah. building, maintaining that and renovating it, and then us tearing out the portables and replacing that with a new building in the back. But they don't want to see the Wake campus torn down and replaced with an entirely new building. Um, and then, of course, shot is a beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, architectural building where it would be the same kind of dynamic where we would leave shot and there's just a few portables there. We'd replace those with permanent buildings. Oh, that was good. the feedback we received from community members and yeah. it fit right in line with what we were wanting to do as well. Yeah. And it'll be a one story just like so yeah. it goes with the cute little neighborhood there and mm -hmm. oh, good. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> One was, um, we keep saying that we don't fall in the category for five-year window for mm -hmm. financial hardship. Right. It feels like financial hardship. We did have a bond. We did have it less than five years ago fail. So can you explain why we aren't in the window if the window is five years and it hasn't five years up? I can because I was in Sacramento last week in the chancellor's office and I asked that question. <laughs> Good. So um, I'm, I've been lucky enough to be a part of the ACBO, which is the Association of, Calif of Chief Business Officers, the Facilities Task Force statewide. So I get the opportunity to ask those direct questions to the chancellor's office, the facilities folks there, and the Department of Finance um, fellow was there as well. And the reason why is because our failed bond was in 2014, right? Our failed bond was in 2014. Here's how they count. 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's not consistent with the mathematical number line. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so we would be requesting these projects for the 1920, uh, sorry, the 2021 spending plan year, which is yet again another year. So they said, no, 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 you fall well outside of the uh, five-year hardship. I tried, yeah. Okay, and then one last plea for a board discussion on uh, and, and really a college discussion on priorities here because mm -hmm. we had, I, I know several of us have brought that up. Um, mm -hmm. I don't feel like we've had a discussion on what priorities are. The admin building has some serious infrastructure problems, but it wouldn't be my first priority. I think in terms of students and classrooms, the physical science building, mm -hmm. uh, something like that next, but um, I just, the board hasn't talked about it. so. I could be convinced um, differently. I just would like us to have that discussion as well as the, the campus because they're impacted. And you're going to have the discussion July 11th. July 11th, I'm going to be um, providing as a report to the board on the facilities master plan draft. Um, it's a, a healthy document, about 100 pages long, so I don't expect us to get through it all at that moment, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of feedback that the board will wanna provide, and it is at a draft stage still. We need to spend the fall going out and talking about it, just as you're um, explaining, and add more more input, more information um, to the report. So we'll, we'll bring it on July 11th. I don't know how much time we'll see what the agenda looks like that we'll wanna talk about it here, or if we just wanna provide feedback to Dr. Benjamin and we go through it, it'll be, a, it'll be a process, an iterative process. Well, that'll be good, but it's the same date we have to approve this plan, and I think the two, the priority discussion should affect what we put in as in this plan. The reason so why these- it's a little these, late for that plan. Well, the reason why these particular projects have been selected, we'll talk about administration building, that's, that's the one in question, right? is the administration building, we have the highest chance of receiving funding from the state for that building compared to other buildings. So it's a little bit more complex than just what we all want. We're trying to obtain as much funding as we can from the state and we want to pick the buildings that we have the highest chance. So there could be a priority of what we and the students and staff and faculty feel needs to be replaced first, but this is looking at what funds could we get first. Does that help? Mm -hmm. It's right. part of the discussion. <laughs> um, Craig? Yeah, this is, uh, I brought this issue up 
a couple of times previously, it, it's like we have <clears throat> real priorities here that affect the students and our throughput rate and the quality of the education that we, that we deliver that affect our quality of our product. And, and then we have like what the state's saying that they'll pay for or won't pay for or when they'll do it. And then they don't honor their word when they tell us they're going to pay for something. Um, when the state, w we're, we're dancing on a different page here. It's a, we're to a whole different tune. And it, it's really frustrating. And now we have to, do, we have to prove this on the 11th um, before we have the answers to our questions. Now, we did try this. I've been around this board for a little while at least. Um, and in 2015, 16, we had a pretty good, and when that, we went out for the last bond measure before that, we had a pretty good idea of what our priorities were. Now we seem to not know what our priorities are, and when we discuss it, not everybody's on the same page. Some thinks it's like what our priorities are, or is it the state's priority? And so when Marsha brought that up again, I'm going, we, we've been talking about this, and we still don't have an answer for it. And I may not be as confused as it may sound, but it's really hard to deal with this. Um, you, now, now we have to vote for something when we don't know how we're going to pay for it. And we don't even, we're not even sure of what it's going to cost us. And maybe next week, so we guess we have to have a special meeting next week so we can figure out how we're going to, you know, what we can do or get some more information. Well, because this is not, with no meetings or no chance to go over this stuff before we have to vote on it is... I think the criteria Lindsay's referring to, remember when Eric Middleton came and he talked about just the complex way in which they rate the buildings and look through all the information. Yeah. And so when you put all of those variables together, you end up with certain buildings. So yeah, I think we've had a lot of discussion about that topic. Well, we had, we had a lot of discussion about like the gym, to do it or not to do yeah. it or why to do it or getting the money. But what we didn't really talk about is what our priorities were we just went with whatever the state's priorities were. And we've got an administration building that if we put money into there, could have a very direct effect on the quality of our students we put, on our, on our product but, quality. When we don't do that and we put it into the gym, yeah, we're gonna have a positive effect, but it's a lot more money and it's not gonna be probably as great an effect as we could get benefit to the college as we could get out of the um, student out of the student services building. So the priorities here are wrong. And, and when it comes to the portables, the idea was to get rid of to we agreed to get rid of the portables on this campus, not at the shot or the Wake campus. We were trying to get rid of those portables and we had a plan for that. That seems to have fallen by the wayside. That's not no longer important or the state doesn't think it is. And I'm wondering if it's because we didn't make that case to the state. We had that education on how the state looks at it, but again, there's not enough information here to make the quality decision. Yeah, uh, Trustee Nielsen, Trustee Croninger, I, I hear what you're saying. Unfortunately, the state is the entity that writes the checks. Yeah, I'm aware of and, that, but and that they doesn't mean we shouldn't ask and the I, questions. I fully appreciate they haven't, uh, in terms of being able to plan and organize and move ahead, they've made it very difficult for us. Uh, but it still remains that they write, write the checks. And I, you know, I heard the presentations over the last nine months or so from, uh, it seems like we've talked about this several times, and we're stuck with this process, which is now gotten worse, and I'm looking forward to hearing the presentation following uh, Lindsay concerning possible funding options. It, it, Jonathan, do you have a question? I was going to say the same thing that, that you said, but I, I think maybe it could be helpful for us to have the building and like the score that made it a high priority of why it's highly likely to get funding, and then you know you gave us the cost of how much it'll be. And then maybe the board might have a chance to look at, okay, this one has an eight on the score to get funding out of 10. This one has a four. And then maybe we can make that decision, like just another column on this spreadsheet that says the cost and then the likelihood of getting state funding. And then we, then we can know for ourselves that, okay, administration and PE and student services are the ones that are high chance and 
this is why we're making the decision because the risk to cost ratio is like best for these instead of not having that. And like we, I do trust your work 100%. Maybe just putting it on there might make the board's decision. Sounds like a good idea. More trusted. So, uh, Craig. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to say that the state's wrong and that we're, or that we're right or we're right and they're wrong. The, when it's confusing, and the reason it's disturbing to me because it's confusing, is not because it's personally that confusing to me, although it is kind of, is, is that we need to at some point come up with our local share of all this money. And yeah, we could borrow some of it, maybe short term, borrow, short term or long term or whatever. There are a bunch of options. However, it's exp they're expensive. Or, but primarily where we get that money from to do all these things we need to do, especially if we're forced to, in order to get contributions from the state, we're forced to do things we might not otherwise do before we did the things we think we really need because of the state. So now we have to make this case, if we're gonna ask our ta the taxpayers in our district to, to pass a bond at some point in the future so that we can meet these needs, which is, we're probably gonna have to do that. I don't see, you know, some tree out here that's shedding dollar bills. So we need, we need to make the situation clear so that we can proceed to get the money. When it's not clear, it's not laid out clearly, we're, we're going to have difficulty getting the money. And that's the reason I brought this issue up. Yes, yeah. Um, what we were trying to do tonight, and what your points are well taken, and we know we need to do some more work on this and have the discussions in order for you to vote on these matters. The point tonight, to show you this once again in another format, but to also give you a fuller context in terms of how to fund it. The only thing we've talked to you about in the last few weeks anyway is a bond. There are other mechanisms that you may or may not like, but we think you at least need to be aware of and you have a fuller financing context. So if we could move to you don't mind yes. hearing and then continue the discussion after the presentation um, from the finance people, that might be helpful. And then what we want to do tomorrow in the context of the entire budget is have you give us direction on what you'd like for us to pursue in terms of facility, just in terms of how to pay for them or not. Um, with that, I, I think that makes sense. And Lindsay, are you going to do the introductions for our next president? They are going to introduce themselves. Okay. Yes, I'll invite them up. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. A pleasure to be here. So we'll be giving you an overview on, in terms of the financing options available for capital funding. My name is Karma Pemba. I'm with Morgan Stanley, and we are bond underwriters. With me today is David Kaznokas, Stradling Yoker, Carlson, New York. They're bond under, uh, lawyers, bond counsel. And then Joanna Bose from KNN Public Finance. They're municipal advisors. So I'll just do a brief introduction before I hand it off to Joanna. Uh, you know, with the passage of Prop 13 in 1978, which eliminated the ability for school districts to issue bonds, the state kind of took over in terms of funding uh, capital facilities. Uh, however, in, um, starting in 1986 with Prop 46, and more recently in 2000 with Prop 39, the onus has kind of shifted back on local measures to fund capital needs. And so tonight's presentation, we'll talk a little bit about your current bond program, where it stands, and the options that you have available uh, for your capital needs. And with that, I'll hand it off to Joanna. Good afternoon. I'm Joanna Bose, as Karma Pemba said, and I am a municipal advisor with KNN, and I have worked with the district in the past. I've also had the fortune of working with President Benjamin at Contra Costa and also with Trustee Parker at Santa Barbara Unified. So it's nice to see both of you again. Um, my job tonight is just to run you a little bit through the history of your uh, past geo bond history. And I'll use my clicker here. So the last bond you did was in 2008. Oh, let's see. Wrong. Here we go. I wanted to get the little light, the green light. Oh, 
little one? Oh, I won't just forget it. Uh, she did your last bond in 2008, and um, it was for $77.2 million. That was a long time ago. You've had, and there's no authorization remaining, which means you have spent, you have issued all those bonds and assumedly spent all those bond proceeds. You have, if you look in the center top uh, chart, 58 million, 50.8 million of outstanding par amount. That does not include the interest on the bonds. That's just the par amount of outstanding bonds of the 66 million issued. You did it in two issuances, one in 13 and one in 16. Also in 2016, you refunded the prior issuance and saved the taxpayers 8.78 million, which was nice, that was a good thing to do. And on the bottom chart is a uh, graphic illustration of your outstanding general bond debt. And you can see the Series B bonds, which were issued in um, 2013, are in the yellow. Thank you. And the blue is the Series C bonds, which you did in 16. And the red is the refunding bonds, which represented the refunding of the first series of bonds in 2008. I mean, and third, yes. Yeah, I'm not very good. Assessed valuation is an important thing to understand if you go forward. Whatever you do, you should just understand, I think, just as your, uh, to your constituents. Um, it is your t total property tax assessment for the entire community college district. It is determined and measured by the county of Santa Barbara. They are doing it right now. It's a lengthy process. And usually in August, um, they notify many of us, including the district, what your total assessed valuation is going to be that year. So they're coming up on 1920. We have 1819. And um, this chart represents that in the bar start in 2003 up until 2019. So you can see that AVs grew by 4.9% in 18, from 1819. And what's really important about the red line, which is the percentage of change, is that uh, when we had the terrible recession in 2008 and 2009, your assessed valuations dropped, but you never went negative as many community colleges did. We also have on the uh, left-hand side some averages, the five-year uh, average growth and the 10-year average growth, just to give you an idea that even though um, you have a very high level of assessed valuation growth in recent years, the five and 10 year averages are lower than that. And that's important going forward because if you do consider doing a general obligation, well, that'll be something that you consider. Lastly, um, I've been asked to speak to your credit rating. It's a very important part of everything you do with the district and, uh, and any kind of borrowing that you do, whether it's uh, in the things that uh, Karma and uh, David are gonna talk about. It is a measure of, it is a two independent agencies, Moody's and S&P rate. You can see your rating is AA1, AA+. Plus. Many community colleges are rated AA, but not many are not rated AA1, AA+. Plus. It's a very high credit rating. It's a very good testimony to the strength of your district's assessed value and also your finances. The one higher rating is AAA, very high <coughs> community colleges that are not community supported, i.e. basic aid, to have. So you have a very strong rating. We thought it would be interesting for you to know the considerations that the, uh, and the things that the rating agencies uh, look to, and you can see there at in the top green bar, the considerations, the, your, the local economy, your outstanding debt burden, <coughs> your strong management team, your finances, and your pension liability. That has become very important in the last 10 years. I'm sure you've read about it at the state level, but this also includes your pension liability and also your other post-employment benefit liability. From your current rating, uh, your most recent rating report, um, you have many good strengths. We listed four of them here for you, and part of them is your deep and diverse Santa Barbara County economy, your state, your stable tax base, and I think your assessed valuation chart supports that, your operating flexibility, which is inherent to CCDs versus K-12s, and that's true, you do have more flexibility in control of your fees. I'm not gonna address this new funding formula that's sort of wreaking havoc with a lot of the stuff we're talking about. And um, the strong financial performance with very strong reserves, which you have done uh, currently and, and, and through the past. Challenges, uh, rising pension costs, OPEP costs. Uh, a lot of colleges are facing that, particularly the pension costs. You don't have any control over that. And you have really no significant revenue raising flexibility. Now, that seems contradictory to the strength. Um, one of the things about California community colleges, and I focus primarily with California community colleges in my practice, is that the rating agents will say, because you are captive of the state, you're feeling that particularly right now. 
and as uh, Karma said, from Prop, because of Prop 13, everything was shifted to the state and you lost local control. So as a result, what you're going through now is what the rating agencies consider a lack of flexibility. As a footnote to that, I will say if you're a, a basic aid or community supported district, there are not many of them in, in California for community colleges. I think there's six, Kathy might know, seven, no, nine. Um, all, they, they are, all their revenue is based upon their assessed valuation. They don't have to worry about student enrollment. All right. So um, they're not very many. So it's, that's, that is the, by the point of talking about not being able to have the flexibility. It's not that you're not doing anything. It's that the state doesn't allow you to do anything. And with that, I'll turn it over to Karma. Thank you. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the funding formula options there. Um, so we listed here funding sources for capital outlay. Obviously, the state does have the Prop 51 bonds out there that Vice President Moss has talked about. But the most common local funding source at the top there is general obligation bonds and what we call COP lease revenue bonds. These are debt instruments backed by property taxes or the general fund. And we'll go into a little bit more uh, in the next coming slides. The next two there, lease and lease back and P3, they're similar in the sense that they try to transfer the risk onto the private entity. And so with the traditional lease, lease back, a private entity is responsible for the construction and the financing risk. They deliver a finished project to the district, and then in turn, district is paying them lease payments over a specified amount of time. In terms of P3, the typical P3 goes even a step further. They not only have construction and financing risk, they also take on operation risk. And so typically you see this more in a revenue generating type of uh, a construction, whether it's a housing or a garage type of project there. And then finally, cash, obviously those are just funds on hand. The consideration for the district is obviously uh, op uh, opportunity cost of using those funds there. Uh, good afternoon. Once again, my name is David Kaznoka. Some of you may remember me as having been the longtime bond counsel for the district. So I was the bond attorney for the 2008 bonds, the 2014 bonds, the 2016 refunding bonds. So we're here as a little bit of deja vu. Um, so for general obligation bonds, Karma had given, looking at the uh, words on the left-hand side of this page, a little bit of the history of how we got to where we are for uh, bond funding for community college districts. Once upon a time, just about all the local uh, initial campuses in California were either funded through a combination of local general obligation bonds with some state dollars. And it was not uncommon until the passage of Proposition 13, which eliminated the district's ability to levy an ad valorem property tax. So between 1979 and 1986, there were no general obligation bonds for anybody. So no school district or community college could access local funding that way. So everyone during that period of time looked to lease revenue bonds or certificates of participation, non-voter approved forms of debt to access outside funds for facility construction. The payment of that obligation we're gonna talk about in more detail, but it came from revenues of the district. And one of the magic things about general obligation bonds is that there's revenue associated with the debt. That's why they're so terribly attractive because once the voters approve a general obligation bond, they're inherently approving the levy of an ad valorem property tax to pay the debt service on the bonds. So legally, the general fund can never be responsible for the repayment of a general obligation bond. And that's why they're so highly rated because they're secured by the full faith and credit and taxing powers of the district. So um, in, 2000, uh, in 1986, the school community had been lobbying for the restoration of the California Constitution of a legal authority to pass bonds. And that's when Article 13A got amended, uh, stating that with two thirds voter approval, a community college district could pass a general obligation bond using the bond proceeds solely for the acquisition and improvement of real property. And a number of colleges were successful in passing two thirds elections bonds, but the stakeholders in the education market 
you know, obviously express frustration because there were a lot more failures than there were passers. So that debate <clears throat> lasted until 2000 when Proposition 39 came on board. Proposition 39 was important not only because it, it reduced the voter passage rate to 55%, but it expanded the purposes for which bonds could be issued to include not only construction, renovation, and repair of facilities, but also furnishings and equipping. And it came in tandem with the public policy statement that the goal of reducing the passage rate was to stimulate class size reduction, student safety, and information technology. And that equipment piece allowed colleges to use bonds to really enhance the technology capacity that colleges had. So the advantages of bonds, those things are true, but the real benefit of a general obligation bond is it generates revenues to pay the debt service on the bonds. And the reason why it's the cheapest form of borrowing is the security is pretty much the gold standard, the full faith and credit and taxing power of the agency. You know, Joanna and Karma have spoken to these external factors like assessed value. Um, and sure, that's a risk. I don't know that it would be a risk here because your outstanding debt and anything you would borrow would be such a small fraction um, of, of the legal allowances. So if, who's ever got the clicker for how do you go to the next? Okay, so um, when Proposition 39 got passed in 2000, there was implementing legislation that went into effect concurrent with the constitutional amendment and it imposed legislative restrictions on the characteristics of a Prop 39 bond. So once you make a decision to place a bond measure on the ballot, if you choose the 55% threshold, then these additional requirements on the bottom of the page, of, of the page become relevant. First, note you can't put a bond measure on the ballot with a majority vote resolution. Two thirds of the governing board need to vote affirmatively to place a measure on the ballot. Secondly, to enhance transparency, like you saw in 2014, for those of you who are on the board, the resolution calling for the election had a five or six or seven page bond project list that appeared in the ballot materials and they described the types of projects that were authorized to be funded out of the bond. So there's this project list requirement that's associated with a Prop 39 bond. And then, like now or later, you would have to agree to have the bond expenditures audited by an independent auditor to assure the community that bond proceeds were spent appropriately for authorized projects. And you would need um, to create and empower a citizen oversight committee to have more independent um, review. What's not on that page? Oh, there it is in the top, statutory limit of $25. So that implementing legislation for community college districts said that in addition to two thirds vote of the board, a project list, the audits, a citizen oversight committee, you can't <coughs> issue bonds if you expect the tax rate ever to exceed $25 per $100,000 of assessed value. So you haven't been close to that number, but it is, uh, for many colleges, a very noticeable um, and important constraint. So if you, to the next page. So timeline for a Prop 39 election. Um, one of the changes that was made in the law from the old days, Proposition 46, when you could have a bond election on any Tuesday, uh, the law changed with Prop 39 and they set election dates. So elections now for Prop 39 bonds have to be in even years when there is a uh, statewide election, and we have the primary now being in March. So March and November are the authorized election dates for a Prop 39 bond. And only in even years, unless at some other time there was a Board of Trustee election or a regularly scheduled election of a political body within whose jurisdiction you are entirely contained. So if Santa Barbara County had a regularly scheduled election in 2021, you could have a bond election on that date, 
but otherwise you're limited to the first Tuesday after the first Monday in March and November of even years. So your choices for elections are March 3, 2020, November 3, 2020, or moving on to March and November of 2022. In order to place a bond on the ballot on any one of those days, the board has to adopt a resolution calling for the election. In most places in the state, the deadline date to do that is in accordance with what the education code says, 88 days prior to the election date, you're obligated to deliver a resolution to the county registrar of voters. That's not the case in Santa Barbara, and it's not the case in the half a dozen different counties where the county registrar of voters has the legal authority to uh, set an earlier date. So in Santa Barbara, they will tell you if you called on the phone, 131 days in order to um, adopt a resolution and deliver it to the county. So for March 2020, for example, for most of the world, December 6th, 2019 is the resolution delivery date. For Santa Barbara, it's October 24th. And at the end of the day, you could probably negotiate 10 days off of that, but it's still pretty early. For a um, November 2020 election, the normal deadline is August the 7th. The Santa Barbara deadline would be June 23rd. So that by June 23rd, or a week before that, you would have had to have concluded all your conversations about projects, gone through the master plan, set your uh, goals and policies, and integrated the views of the community along with your own priorities and balance that out and come up with a bond package that was attractive to the community, responded to their needs, and also satisfied your highest priorities of your facility master plan. You'd have to wrap that up by June of 2020. Okay, so the next. So, I'll take so this yep. real quick. So what we wanted to do is give you a sense of how a bond program re reacts to different uh, factors and inputs. The two most important factors, as David mentioned, AV growth assumption and timing of issuance are the two most in fact, important factors in creating a bond program. So here we've got a hypothetical 2020 election for um, $125 million, and we put together four scenarios. So if you look at the upper left there, that's assuming you issue all $125 million as one series with a very low AV growth rate assumption of 3%. That translates to a tax rate of 9.65 per 100,000. Again, the maximum allowable is $25 per 100,000, so you're significantly below that number. If you look at the top right, uh, scenario 1B, now we've assumed that instead of 125 issued once, it's actually split over two, year, uh, two years and two series of 62.5 million apiece. And by doing that, the tax rate would then be 9.25. At the bottom there, are, there are exactly the same scenarios. However, we've now changed the AV growth assumption from 3 to 3.5, still below your 10-year average. But you can see there the impact to the tax rate there. So for example, uh, in a one series scenario, going from a 3% AV growth rate to a 3.5% AV growth rate, your tax rate would be uh, reduced by 65 cents. And so you know, ideally you'd work on creating a timing or issuance schedule that works with the capital drawdowns that your district would actually need. But I just, we just wanted to give you a sense of the impact of uh, changes to some of the criteria there. And then finally, in terms of- Can I just ask a yeah, quick sure. question on that? Uh, page when when you talk about these um, you know estimated AV growth rate, um, but in reality, it's is it the county that's saying this is the actual growth rate? So the county is deciding each year how much everybody's paying. Correct? That's right. So for example, you're, if we're doing a 2020 election, as you can see at the bottom, some of those years are out 39, 40, 45. We've estimated that 3% going out to 45. In reality, as you've experienced with 2008 election, your tax rate is significantly lower than projected. And so every year the county reassesses the AV, 
and, and so if, you're, if your projection was at three, but you ended up at 5%, you've actually built yourself a buffer and your tax rate would be lower than uh, the projected number there. Um, and finally, just a historical um, table here about it with, uh, in terms of geo bonds. This is the most common way of funding local measures, especially since 2000 here. So if you look at this table here, um, there's a 1,282 elections that have passed since 2000 that were accounted for about 156 billion in uh, geo bonds. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about the COP. So really this topic is about non-voter approved debt. So how do school districts and community college districts manage non-voter approved debt? Some agencies can go to the bank and get a loan from the bank and sign a loan agreement for its repayment. You can't do that because community college districts don't have a legal authority to enter into a loan agreement. So all non-voter approved debt for school districts takes the form of a lease. Um, so lease debt financing, a lease is the obligation that evidences the debt. And most often, uh, these are like home equity loans where the community college would say, we have a, a real estate asset called a district administration building that has uh, a value of $50 million and we're gonna take a home loan against the equity that's in that building. And it would involve the college leasing the, finan leasing the facility to for example, the Community College League Financing Authority and leasing it back and agreeing to make lease payments for the obligation of staying in its own building and, and uh, occupying it. It would sell interest in that lease. So when someone says COPS, that's certificates of participation and a certificate is a little piece of paper that says, uh, I, Santa Barbara Community College District, agree to pay lease payments under this document um, semi-annually for 20 years, and you own a $5,000 interest in that lease, so you're participating in the stream of lease payments that we make um, to a bank. So certificates of participation are very common, and it was really way back in the day when school districts and colleges needed to buy a new school bus, they went to the local bank and the local bank entered into a lease financing with the school district and provided the $150,000 for the school bus. So it's a tried and true and tested method. Lease revenue bonds take the same lease idea and change the form of the evidence of the debt from a cop to a bond. The league has thought that this is such an important vehicle for community colleges that in the late 90s, they created a financing authority solely for the purpose of issuing lease revenue bonds on behalf of the member colleges in California. And we've probably done 25 or 30 lease revenue bonds for different colleges along the way. Were they more popular during a period of time when there were no general obligation bonds? Well, COPS probably were, but nowadays, Colleges still do lease revenue bonds, more often thinking of them as a bridge loan to a bond. So when you enter, when you sell lease revenue bonds or COPs, many of them do so with the intent that they're going to be paid off well in advance of maturity from the proceeds of a local bond. And some colleges currently um, would say, we think we're gonna do a bond in 2020 and 2022, but we have to get started on some projects today. So we're gonna sell a COP or a lease revenue bond for $25 million. It's a pain on your general fund appropriations because you're struggling to make ends meet. And under federal tax law, you're allowed to capitalize the first three years of interest payments on a, on a financing. So colleges would sell a lease revenue bond, they would borrow the interest that would otherwise be paid for the first three years. They wouldn't schedule any principal payments for those three years. So basically they're not making any out-of-pocket payments for three years. That's the longest window that you can create within which you have to come along with a general obligation bond 
to pay off that lease revenue bond, or the debt service is going to start out of the general fund. And I think Karma has a slide as to how much those payments would be. So COPS and lease revenue bonds can either be a long-term permanent source of non-voter-proof debt, payable from appropriations that you would have to make from the general fund, or they can be viewed as short-term bridge financing towards a longer-term permanent financing from a general obligation bond, which is really, from most colleges' perspective and my experience, the logical way in which those types of facilities um, should be financed. Because if you pay them always for 20 years out of your general fund, you're taking money out of the classroom and you're putting it into facilities. And we have a better vehicle for facilities, which are general obligation bonds or state matching funds. So those are lease financings, evidence, you know, call them COPS, call them lease revenue bonds. But it's a useful vehicle either as a bridge or as a long-term method of uh, paying for college facilities. As David mentioned, we've just put together a preliminary financing results so you get a sense of uh, cost. Uh, this is assumes a $5 million project fund. And similar to a home mortgage, you know, based on the asset that is pledged, you know, you can pick the term. So in this case here, we've shown three scenarios, a 15-year final maturity, a 20-year final maturity, and a 25-year final maturity. And so if you look at scenario one, the 15-year final maturity, that averages about 440000 a year to borrow approximately $5 million. If you look at scenario three, that uh, stretches out the financing by 10 more years. And there, um, the average debt service is roughly, let's call it, uh, 315. So uh, the difference is about $125,000. However, if you look at the total cost, in scenario three, you're paying back $7.8 million, including the $5 million. Whereas in scenario one, you're paying back 6.6 .6 million. And so by stretching it out by, uh, for another 10 years, you end up paying almost 800,000 more in borrowing cost. Um, just to give you a sense in terms of uh, interest rate number here, scenario one, the numbers that we've run right now, average about 2.6% cost, all in costs. So you're borrowing your loan for about 2.6% uh, if you want to think of it as a home loan. And can I just ask, does TIC stand for total interest cost? Yes. Okay, thanks. So, so and does the interest rate vary, depend, like the ratings, the Moody ratings on bonds that's, and stuff, depending that, that, on your condition? That, that's right. Uh, typically what happens is your rating for a geo bond and your COP are correlated. Um, uh, typically, Moody's and S&P have one or two notch rating based on your geo bonds. So whatever your geo bonds are rated, they typically rate it one or two notches below that because it's your general fund versus the property tax. Uh, but you really don't have it out of whack in the sense that, you know, if you're a double A1, very highly rated geo under, and then your underrating COP is A, for example, it's not, it's not going to spread out that far. And similar to that geo table, you know, we've put together historical, uh, K through 14 lease revenue bonds, COP uh, financing since 2008 here. There have been 596 transactions totaling over 7 point, almost 7.2 billion. And on, on the far left there, we put some of your neighboring districts that have also issued uh, COP lease revenue bonds in the past. Happy to take questions. Um, actually, I have, a, I have a question about the it kind of went fast for me. The bridge loan idea that where you're essentially not paying anything for three years. Mm -hmm. is, did I hear that right? You're betting on the come that you will get the bond that the bond passed. And uh, therefore, escape uh, paying out of uh, general revenue. Is, did you I hear that say right? That. But, but I would say that those, you, those districts that have decided to put their general fund on the line as contributing to facilities do so having to acknowledge that there may never be a bond. Right. There may be a bond that doesn't sure. pass. So you'd be out of your mind to do a lease revenue bond, which you knew you couldn't afford right. to pay for starting in year four. Um, so you can't count on a bond. So you have to look at the borrowing plan and say, I can afford this plan if this is my plan for the next 25 years. And the bond takeout is a 
bonus package in some way. Um, so yeah, it's so when you do your bond, when you when you do the bond, you can list as one of the projects, projects the repayment, paying, yeah. paying paying back paying, the, paying back that lease or lease revenue bond. Got it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I would just say it's also obvious you're not escaping the interest. You're just putting no. it off. You're going to yeah. pay. No, I understand. Yeah, you're going to you're going to pay the interest. It, yeah. It's uh, you're you're just escaping the cash flow, saving the cash flow for immediately. yeah immediately. General yeah, got it. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, was okay. first. Um, thank you, and. Um, it's an interesting idea, um, and I'm um, I'm interested to see all these other community college districts that are using it. Um, I'm always concerned um, when you're uh, repaying interest um, and repaying uh, repaying that from a general fund, um, and so I would worry about that. Um, you know, our, our issue uh, is obviously there will be a recession coming. We're in declining enrollment. Um, and so if we were not able to pass a bond, we could get in a situation where even uh, what might seem like a fairly small amount right now could be painful. Um, what, over <laughs> say the past 20 years, um, you know, through the recession cycles, how much trouble has, has there been a community college district that's really gotten into trouble with their, with the COP? Um, I mean, they. I don't know if they're all doing what you're suggesting here. Is actually very small. I mean, your 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 uh, example is for five million dollars, which really and truly would be, you know, just about a getting a project started. Um, and so, is that what all these other community colleges are doing? Are they doing these pretty small amounts to get a project started, type thing? I think it varies. Uh, a lot of the, uh, and David can ch uh, chime in also, a lot of districts have different uh, reasons for doing it. Some have done smaller ones that they were doing um, what we call uh, like solar type of projects, but then they were getting money coming in from somewhere else to pay that. And so, uh, you know, that was their idea there. Some have done, as uh, David says, bridge financings, whereas uh, others have taken a bigger, a bigger piece. You know, we're, we're working with... Uh, some districts that are potentially looking at, you know, 25 to 40, 50 million dollars COPs, um, and so it's it's it really uh, varies. And, and the ones that are looking at 25 to 50 million dollars COPs, are they planning to do a bond later, or are they planning for that to be paid from their general fund? Uh, eventually, uh, potentially a bond. Some of them uh, have uh, other revenue sources that are coming in potentially to help pay pay for that. So. When you do a lease revenue bond or a COP, legally speaking, the general fund is on the hook. But those districts that do larger lease revenue bonds and don't think of it as a bridge, think of it as a project that may not have been politically correct for voter approved bonds. They may have rental income from surplus property. They may have redevelopment monies. They may have developer fees. They may have other flexible sources of revenue collection that they're dedicating to this purpose. So they're leveraging a revenue stream that they have independent of state apportionment money and raising capital facilities funds so they can do some projects today which they couldn't really sensibly do nickeling and diming every, every year for 20 years. So they, these are oftentimes paid for by non-general fund monies, but the legal documents will put your general fund on the hook. And the, and the covenant to budget and appropriate every year is an enforceable covenant. And if the bondholders went to court, they'd win that case to compel you to budget and appropriate from legally available funds before you paid faculty, before you paid your other bills. They'd win that case. And investors know that, which is why they're willing to purchase these types of bonds still at favorable rates to public agencies. And Dr. Benjamin, have you had experience with one of these or no? No, we didn't, we didn't do one in Contra Costa. The purpose here tonight is we're not, oh, the mic. <laughs> we're trying to give you the options. We're not uh, recommending any of this. We're just 
trying to give you information on what's available so that you can have that in your decision making process. Marcia. Um, you mentioned uh, what is, shall we say, popular or not popular when you're going for a bond or even if you're going for a bond that repays uh, one of these COPs. Um, what I keep reading is that a project like an administration is not popular with the um, public. They want to pay for classrooms. They want to pay for things that are direct uh, student, directly related to students. Would you agree with that? Well, I would agree. I would agree that on a scale of one to ten, some projects poll at a 10 and some projects poll at a one. So when a bond program is done, the messaging themes focus on the projects that have achieved nine or 10 ranking, but the ballot language and the project list is broadly written to include the administration building unless there's some political mandate to noticeably exclude it so that you can communicate to the community that it's noticeably excluded. But typically, the bond project list would be extremely inclusive, um, but the messaging may not focus on the administration building. The messaging may focus on other facilities that are programmatic and instructional and produce impacts of the local economy by training nurses and EMT and those sorts of things. But it's, it's atypical that a project like a swimming pool or administration building is excluded from the lawful uses of bond funds. It's just not a, pr a prominent project for purposes of the effort. And that's the purpose. That's the purpose of the polling, too, or just yeah. to gauge the interest in what they would support. And it all depends also on how you, as uh, he indicated, how it's listed on the board. In, I mean, in the uh, list of projects, how you include that. And I, sorry, I think that that's two important points that you and Craig brought up. And with the context that we've been talking about with business services or in Lindsay, it's within the context of state funded. If we were talking about facilities within the context of a bond, then that rating would come in. So we haven't had that discussion because we've only been discussing how do we get these projects funded based on what's available to the state. And so I think everybody agrees that that rating is important because of the community connection with all of that. So I mean, I think that we've been, there's so many things that we have to take care of in a, some point pretty quick here um, because of deadlines. I, I think that well, obviously not Dr. Benjamin fully, but our next CEO president is going to have the charge to really start looking at some of this stuff. Um, the Peter McDo administration and career education building modernization as it's listed, which I don't think I'd ever really seen it that way, Lindsay, um, because automotive is there, because Tesla did tour our facilities a couple years back and the, that whole industry, it could be attractive to our voters if it, was, if it was in that spirit of what we were discussing when Tesla came on board and to see what the need was for the workforce in the community and how they just really need to build up their engineers because it's no longer going in the car and changing the oil. I mean, our cars, Audis, you open them and it's pretty in there. I don't even know how you would do anything in those cars. Um, so it is, I'm not interested in the other option. I, it, it, that's just, you know, you're signing up for a loan that you can't pay. And um, I am concerned about our credit rating. We do have a good credit rating because we have traditionally had reserves. We have traditionally had sound fiscal. Um, and, and then the states just flipped all this on us with their new common core math of counting a year twice, which is silly to me. Um, so uh, I thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin, for putting this to us. And, and so it's, I mean, again, the census is not just for us to just sort of think about, but that because this is to really think about because at some point we need to make a decision with these deteriorating facilities. Yes. Well, you were talking about this before I came. I was yeah. just trying to help you get all the information you need. So. Mm -hmm. And I agree. To make a decision because you're, if you're going to do anything about your buildings, you're going to have to have a bond sooner or later. Yeah. And these are like these two things they talked about, I think, are kind of stopgap measures that you could possibly use.
but you're going to have to plan for it at some point in the future, or the buildings will you, will just continue to patch. Craig. Yeah, I have a, my question is that, thank you. You've been very informative. You kind of covered the bases, and it was um, and a couple of new points that weren't on the front of my brain. And um, you know, we do have substantial reserves. What we're looking at is some deficit spending that could possibly, and then we need to put a few million dollars, and we have uh, reserves for uh, construction. That keeps getting whittled at because we need to do things. And um, now we're looking at expending that plus spending down our reserves with, with money, but we're not spending our reserves all the way down. We're only going to, if we dip into our general reserve, we're only going to be down to the state minimum percentage of it. Or we set, we drew a line. So um, w if we went below that $20 million in that reserve account, maybe Dr. Benjamin off the top of your head, if we, if we dipped into that to get started here, and we were transparent and informed the public as we're going and what our plans are. If we dipped into that, how's that going to, how would that affect or would it affect our, our ability to get good interest rates on the bonds? Would our credit look good or? When you, you have substantial reserves, when those reserves change, the rating agencies are going to look at that and make a judgment about yeah. The rating agencies have standards that they measure you against. Some of them are national, which I disagree with. But when you below, so if you've been holding an, a, a high level of reserves and then you dip down 50%, they'll ask you why, and they'll ask you how you're going to rebuild it. Because they get part of your rating was built on that. Correct. So if you say, well, this is the way it is, or if you drop down to the minimum, I, I'm not going to say that that is going to lower your rating, but it will be a consideration along with declining enrollment and other things that are happening in the funding formula. They take everything into advance and pump it all together. There are percentages assigned to each category, but it would okay. be an, it could have an effect. So there is a rating system that's mm -hmm. multifaceted. Yes. yes, sir. Thank you. Know, Thank I you. think to add to that, you know, as Joanna showed you those considerations there. Yes. Those are considerations that are the rating agencies look at. Strength in one offsets another. However, the offset factor is there is a limit, right? And mm -hmm. so if you're in the AA1 category, the medium f uh, fund balance might be X. And so even though the strength in AV might offset some of it, if you're way below X, that will impact your rating mm -hmm. uh, category. So all more the sense of urgency to get our financial house in order. Mm -hmm. I cheated and I went ahead to slide 21 for tomorrow. And so that line that Craig's talking about, because Lindsay Thank puts you. together these wonderful graphics. And so yes, Craig, based on the decline, your rating would look different because you won't think of it like your debt to ratio, income debt to ratio, right. that your um, credit yeah. score. Yeah. Plus we, plus we have to deal with yep. the structural operating mm -hmm. deficit. I mean, that's on top of it. I think you've got two significant factors that have changed since our previous rating. Did you have a quick question, Kate? Yeah, just a quick question. And I don't know which one of you might know this because it's none of your areas of total expertise, but you might know this because you're paying attention. Um, does it affect a community college or a school district's bond passage rate if they are both running bonds in the same election? Yeah, these aren't the people. So if we were running a bond, we're uh, turning you from a lawyer into a if we are running a bond, analyst. You know, I think the answer is generally no. It doesn't adversely affect, in part because the mission of a K-12 district is different than the mission of a community college district. So even though we are asking, I, I clearly they're different, but we're asking the same voters to fund bonds at the same uh, election cycle. I mean, a lot of us sit back and wonder, where's the straw that breaks the camel's back? Is there a tax tolerance limit that's achieved um, uh, too quickly when the K-12 and the community college go for a bond at the same time. But it, it hasn't been a, my experience that that's the case. The most recent poll that was done for Merced Community College, um, <clears throat> they got very positive results for a March 2020 ballot. They asked on the, on the poll, what if you knew if that Merced Union High School District was going for a $120 million bond at the same time 
and the support for the college's bond was higher after that question was asked than before. And so that had a favorable effect because a lot of voters look at the educational package that's offered in their community and they want it all to be good. So I would think most professional people in the politics world would not tell you that a K-12 or a K-8 in a college can't go at the same time. There's, there's no data that really supports the damaging impact that one has on the other. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to give you one other example. Opposite uh, to, uh, that West Valley Mission was in the same election timetable as uh, Santa Clara Unified. Uh, and they both had large elections and they both passed hugely. And that's uh, only like eight months after the county of Santa Clara passed a $500 million affordable housing bond, GEO bond. So it is different for every county, mm -hmm. but um, that, I think that's just a, a positive example. Thank you. Okay. Marsh, you have a quick comment or question? Yeah, so question. We need um, to move on. Do you have reflections on the parcel tax that just failed in LA County? Uh, that didn't even get a majority. So. Well, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of. <laughs> LA County. LA County. LA yeah. USD. Yeah. LA USD. Yeah, you know, you know, they've got a lot of bonds outstanding, and uh, they've had issue issues with some of their bonds, and so it could potentially be a. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some fatigue. Fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. If you've ever seen an LA County tax bill, you might. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you get that tax bill and see, and the advantage, well, you yeah. see how many are listed. He on gets there. it. I, I get it. it. <laughs> Turn you off. Yeah, it's big. Yeah. There's, that, that there's a lot on ours too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much for coming in. I think all this uh, information is. Uh, a bunch of it's new to me, maybe not to everybody else here, but I think it's important for us to have this information as we discuss going on about when and if we have a bond, and these last questions, I think, uh, tell us uh, we, we're going to need uh, good polling, political information. Some of the people here tonight have some of that because of the, where they work, but uh, I don't think any of them would say they're the final answer on the politics of this. But thank you again. It was very, very helpful. Uh, um, we're going to move on to uh, item 6.1, which is appointment of labor negotiator for the uh, Board of Trustees. There are two items on closed session tonight, items one and two, which you can see on the following page of the uh, agenda. And the board's being asked to appoint uh, Lindsay Moss as the uh, labor negotiator uh, for those two items. This is a formal action that the board needs to take annually. Uh, she's been acting in this capacity and this vote just formalizes her okay. responsibilities. Do, do I hear a motion? I motion to approve, uh, to appoint Lindsay Moss as labor negotiator for closed session items one and two as noted in 7.1. Is there a second? Second. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none, is all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? A uh, motion passes. So item 6.2, uh, we now move to is the uh, superintendent president search profile that we have all been communicating uh, uh, about with our consultant and among ourselves to some extent. Um, and we have a draft, we've gone through several drafts. We have a draft that was received um, a couple days ago, I think, yesterday. yesterday. And so tonight, uh, hopefully, we can come to an agreement to uh, either adopt this uh, draft or make whatever necessary fine uh, tuning to it. Trustee Haslam. I'd like to move adoption uh, simply because that will allow us to know what it is that we're going to be discussing. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion? Trustee uh, Abood. I think this did a great job of capturing the many, many, many different opinions that we have here. So I think uh, she did a great job, and I'm ready to vote yes on it. Uh, I agree. Any other comments or? Yeah, I actually, I. Oh, Dr. Fisher is on the phone. Oh, can she hear us? Can we hear her? Can you check to see? 
She can hear us. Uh, yeah, that's what she said. She can hear. She's in the room. I see her phone on, and I see uh, audio when you guys talk. So I know audio is going to it. I don't know if she's getting it. If you can change it around. Well, is that a <coughs> is that a moot point? If if we have no questions and are ready to vote, I would I would move. I do. Yeah. I'm, I'm just waiting for her to make sure she's on the phone. Okay. It was a good question. Did you get it? He's working. Oh, okay. But I'm thinking now. Yeah, so they can continue the con you can continue the conversation. Okay. So I looked at the I've been looking at the ACCT searches that I've already underway for other colleges. And so my first question, I guess in reviewing gosh, a lot of different documents and specifically the um, the CEO retention study from the league and the vision for success and looking at the league recommendations for this process that we're going through. Um, under minimum qualifications, we're um, number three. And I was wondering, I want to broaden it to include, um, to sort of make it lean towards our mission. And so we You're talking about these, item, I'm, I'm sorry, item three? Minimum qualifications yeah, okay. number three. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I remember Pamela saying that this was standard across all, and it's not, because I've looked at the ACCT searches, most recently the one that came out for down south, and that one is not listed as a minimum qualification. Um, so then that led me to sort of continue to research and look through some more stuff. And I was wondering if broadening it to read something that says demonstrated understanding of sensitivity to the linguistic, economic, social, cultural, um, and political factors that impact teaching and learning for all students, faculty, and staff. And I felt that that just really, because we, we have this great list here, um, but the list can go on and on and on and on. And I just started thinking that I feel that if we, if somebody came in that understood and was sensitive to those different factors that impact teaching and learning for students and staff, that was more narrow in focus to our college mission. But my understanding is, whether some other school used it or not, that it is mandata mandated uh, by the uh, ed code or by some other regulation, but I would re let This uh, is their ACCCT searches, the current searches they have. No, the no, no, excuse me, can anybody hear me? Yes. yes. Holly, can you hear me? Let me clarify my statement. That, that particular language is not about HCCT at all. That particular language is what the California uh, requirements are for community college announcements. You can add to it. What you can't do is take away from it. But it's not an ACCT guideline. So if you're looking at other ACC searches elsewhere, there may not be any mention of diversity at all, but in California there is. I think probably Dr. Mitchell can speak to that as well. So I just want to clarify that's not an ACCT issue, that's a California code issue. So this is for- Unless like, that's changed. This is Crossman, mm -hmm. Crossman Kukayama School, uh, California. Their president it's, it's, for Cal it's for California community colleges. My knowledge doesn't extend to whether or not it's required in other K-12 or other settings, but for community colleges, it's been there for probably 20, 25 years. It's not new at all. Okay, so it's not here, and this job is posted on your ACCCT website. Are you yeah. talking about the which, which, I don't know what you're referring Grossman to. Grossman Kuyamaka Community posted. College District. She says it's not. For their minimum, no. oh, for their minimum calls, well then. No. They need to stay and they need to take care of that. <laughs> unless, uh, as I say, unless something has changed, well, that it's no can we longer verify required. That's my one one sure. person talk well, at a time. Yeah. yeah, can we verify something's changed? Because this is posted for people to apply. Okay, okay, okay. So, but, but it it is, is Marcia available there now? Because she should be able to speak to that. You're, you're interim HR director? Marcia, yes, she is. Her vice, vice, her vice, yeah, vice president, I mean. She she, should, she's coming she to the. She would know that. Okay. 
Hold on a moment. Okay. Greetings, members of the board. What is being referenced is this is a minimum qualification and it is posted as one of the requirements. That specific verbiage, no, because there has been some variation. But there has to be okay. language that includes demonstrated understanding of sensitivity to and respect for diverse. In essence, this is a requirement with educational administrator positions and faculty positions. Good. So can we say sensitivity to the respect for the diverse linguistic, economic, social, cultural, and political factors that impact teaching and learning for all students. But you've got to have the race, all that race and gender stuff in there. If you look at mm. your policies, if you yeah. look at your non-discrimination policy yeah. that the district has, all of these, we get these as federal requirements. Right, no, I understand what's in the statute, but I am trying to see, you know, the list is great. Are we, you know, the video that Luce sent out and just to make sure that or can we add that something, somehow that this impacts teaching and learning? Because that is what's important to the minimum qualification, that someone, you could, can't just be sensitive to this, it has to tie in to that impact of teaching and learning, because that's what we're here for. And I feel like that's important. So anyway, so that's point number one. Um, under preferred qualifications, when I looked at the CEO retention study and looked at some of the research on the um, Chronicle for Higher Ed, um, the finance, the emphasis on finance management and fundraising was huge. Um, and I think that we need to add. Well, it's wonderful what we're doing. Does she want to mute her phone? Pamela, you might want to meet, mute your I, I, I lost. I lost you for a while there, so I'm not sure. You were saying something about the preferred qualifications, and then I lost you. That, so That's okay. So in my research um, at looking at the CEO retention study and looking at the current context mm -hmm. of president CEOs, and they noted that 62% of presidents, most of their time is spent on financial management, 58% on fundraising. Um, and then the two other studies, uh, respectively, were 71% and 61%. That, that CEO's president stated that financial matters were the biggest challenges to president that presidents face. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly one of our biggest challenges here. And I think that it needs to be highlighted in the preferred qualifications that this candidate has to come to the table with extensive budget and financial management in addition to fundraising and development. I really think so. As a well, I, I'm, yeah. certainly, I'm certainly not opposed to that at all. I took those preferred qualifications from the input you gave me when we met two weeks ago, and then from the input I got from a number of you, the financial shows up, of course, in your opportunities list, challenge list. It also shows up again in your ideal characteristics. But if you want to pull it out again and put it in the preferred, that, that's not a problem. I was simply reflecting what, you know, the direction, if you will, that I was given two weeks ago. So that's, that would be up to the whole board. I didn't get that feedback from anybody up to this point, however, saying that it needed to be in that column. Rather, I was asked to stress it in the other two places. And so that, I think we did it in the other two places. Yeah, and this is for us because we've gotten, you guys, so much information in the last couple of weeks on the budget and this presentation and today and we'll get more tomorrow um and when i looked mm -hmm. at the, um when i looked at the what is it i'm talking to the my colleagues here when i looked at the conducting a successful search from the lead that was one of the things that they noted they said yeah you can have very broad um things you want in there but if you want something very specific and i think we do I think it's I think it's difficult to as, as the preferred qualifications are stated now they are they are general and they don't p pertain to any specific issue I think we address those issues uh, in in the opportunities and challenges the successful new superintendent president will be a college leader who and it, it's it's addressed in several items number two and I think perhaps others so I I, I really think by pulling that, the financial out, and not taking consideration. Maybe there's other things the board would like to have as well and preferred qualifications. I don't. Getting I, our I, financial I, house in order is yeah. going to consume a lot of time yeah. for the new president, superintendent, and I think that that is the priority. Well, I, I don't think we're, going. I don't think by not having it there is, is de-emphasizing whatsoever the financial, the importance of financial 
uh, issues that we face and the importance of them. Just as the way I see it, I, I agree because at the last meeting about this, I had said I would prefer that working with a board is a uh, preferred qualification. And the advice we got was putting something that specific and preferred is a red flag to applicants because it makes them think that there's a really big problem. I mean, there is, but we might not want to put that in preferred because it might raise questions and it is addressed. And I think we would all have our own preferred that we want to get in there and it could end up being eight points long. And I think we captured everything this person needs to do in the opportunities and challenges. And I think we discussed keeping preferred simple. So I just, I it makes make sense to me. One comment about this, <clears throat> and I probably shouldn't, but this is paper. Yeah. You're going to get three or four different views of this person. This is just a paper piece. You can drive that fiscal question all the way through. You're going to have time with these individuals by themselves. You've got that number two under the leader, college leader who, that's very specific on the fiscal. And they have to write to these, I'm assuming, and that's what gets them eliminated or uh, moved forward. Dr. It's Benjamin, one, yeah. one, that's, that's I apologize. Just my comment. Yeah, when I look at this, it's so broad. The the qual I mean, I don't even know who <coughs> this. Per like this is basically it's just open. <coughs> when I look at the percentage of time, and it's been a lot of hours that this board has spent, the major items have had to do with facilities <laughs> or structural deficit <laughs> and all of that. That is one. That is our top priority here. I mean, we just had a presentation yeah. on what we need to fund facilities. And so I am not prepared to vote for this unless, because I think that this is so important that we get the person that understands that we need to get our financial house in order and it is gonna take a lot of time and energy and resources to do it. Trustee Nelson. Um, I really understand what Veronica is saying. Um, I appreciated uh, Mr. Abood's comments, which I tend to agree with in this case. Um, I, um, I have, some considerable experience hiring, and um, I, I think we've covered it under um, in the next section describing a college leader who, and I I um, I do not agree that we should be stated at the top. Um, I'm not really that adamant about it one way or the other. Um, what I am adamant about is we need to get the ball going not sit on it. Um, we, will have, uh, we will have opportunities to put emphasis on certain points as, we, as the process goes along. This is not our first rodeo. Um, however, the Veronica's uh, point of concern is, is relatively valid. I see why she would think that. I just wanted to add a comment. The whole point is to cast a net so that you do have people apply and you want to get as broad a base as possible, your committee, your search committee, will be able to help narrow that down. There will be many questions. There will be all sorts of points of emphasis to help your committee be able to narrow it down to present you finalists. The finalists have a very extensive process in terms of their presentations on campus, their interactions with all the various groups, there are a number of mechanisms that are built in the process to help narrow this down so that you will have your opportunity to ask questions to challenge. This is just getting the net to be able to bring as many people as possible who are qualified to be able to be considered for the position. So this is what the league says about that. They said a broad poll provides boards with the opportunity to consider a wide variety of skills, backgrounds, and experiences, which is what we're seeing here. They say, however, narrowing the expectations may result in fewer applicants, but those applicants will be more likely to have the background the board has determined is necessary to lead the institution. So I'm going with the latter. Okay. Any other comments? Trustee Haslam. I, I think uh, Veronica's point is well taken. Uh, it is important, and, but I'm satisfied that under this, the second section, we, we actually do cover that. But if the inclusion of one additional line in that prior section would get her vote, I'm all for it. Because I think we really have to move, I, I mean, I don't think it's gonna make a lot of difference one way or the other, but I'm all for it so that we can move on. Trustee Croninger. Um, 
I'm sympathetic also with what Veronica is saying. Um, maybe a person skilled in financial, fiscal management, really short, would not eliminate too many people in that net and put the emphasis there. I also am a bit concerned about two other elements relating to this. One is our number two includes that last phrase and has the ability to generate new revenue. I, that to me is not real. I mean, we're talking about a state-funded government institution here. That's where our money comes from. And I don't see anybody, I just don't see that as an important qualification to generate new revenue, and I wouldn't want to send people off in that direction so much as dealing with the revenue that we get, which is from the state. Trustee Parker. Um, yep, I uh, agree with what uh, Trustee Croninger said uh, in terms of that, that language about um, finding new revenue. So if um, you want to suggest an, adap uh, an adap adaptation for that. My suggestion is for under preferred qualifications for number two, that we list administrative experience in fiscal management and progressively senior positions with major supervisory or supervisory and decision-making responsibilities, just make a slight addition to number two. Um, for number three, I think in the, in the minimum qualifications section, I think for the superintendent president, it is more uh, than teaching and learning. And so I think that we need to leave it at the background of all students, faculty, and staff, because there are HR issues that can come up that really are not necessarily about what's going on in the classroom. Um, and so I think that that piece should stay the same. Um, one thing I would point out is that our RAP defines gender as sex. Um, this just lists gender identity. Um, and so I would suggest that we add in gender. Can, in this day and age, gender and gender identity are not the same thing. Um, and so that we add in gender b before gender identity, but leave the rest of that one. Talk about item three under minimum qualifications. Under minimum qualifications. And then Trustee Croninger, did you have specific language that you wanted to, did you I, just- Excuse me, can I, can, I inter, can I interject a minute here, mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Miller? The, uh, first of all, however you do the language on three, I would recommend, that I took this language out of your brochure. This is the exact language that you use about the sensitivity to, et cetera. It's the language you used three years ago. If, as I understand, the best I can understand what Vice uh, President Marcia was saying, that that has maybe changed a little bit. So what I would recommend for that, whatever it is today, if it has been changed, then that's what you need to follow unless you want to add to it. So as opposed to us all trying to figure that out, I think you could defer to Marcia to actually do that for you, because that's where, first of all, it came out of your brochure. Secondly, maybe it has changed. If it's changed, then she can update it for you. But I'm more concerned about the, on the fiscal part, mm -hmm. if you decide you want to add something to the preferred, my recommendation to you would be add a fourth item, something along the lines, I think I heard Marcia say something like, you know, skilled in fisc highly skilled in fiscal management. I would not add it to number two for this reason. Amount if you put it in there, it sounds like you have to have been a fiscal administrator. People who read that will think you had to have been a chief business officer or a um, controller or something like that. So you're not requiring administrate. I know you don't mean that, that they have to have been the chief fiscal officer. You want them to know fiscal issues. Then add a number four and, and say that, but don't, don't mix that up with the progressively responsible positions because it sounds like progressively responsible positions in fiscal areas. And I don't think that's what you're saying. Right, Doc. That would, that would make, that, that would cheer all the CBOs out there, I can tell you, because they would say, oh, good, this is one I can go get. And I don't think that's what you're saying. Dr. Is Fisher, it? this is Kate Parker, um, just responding uh -huh. since I was the one that made that comment. No, I completely take your point. And would a simple recommendation then from you would be like a number four, higher skills in fiscal management? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, something I, like that. I would that, support that. that. Would, if everybody can live with that, we can certainly say that. I think you've conveyed it elsewhere, but it, it won't hurt that you say it again there, if that 
makes people more comfortable. Trustee uh, Haslin, would you accept that as a friendly uh, oh, amendment? Oh, yes, very friendly. <laughs> I think that's a very friendly amendment. Uh, to, go back to, <laughs> to go back to number two then, what about just stopping with maximizing its potential impact, period, leaving out the ability to generate new revenue? And just to be clear, I don't look at the foundation and the donors as revenue. I mean, this is different from that concept. So. Well, let me respond to that. First of all, you in your 130 plus responses that you received, which by the way, probably set a record. I know it set a record in my experience. Uh, so you had a tremendous response. Uh, finding new revenue was something that came up a lot. If that doesn't convey what you mean or want to convey, then, then you should take it out. It is a very common language in presidential and chancellor search announcements these days, and it usually means, yes, sometimes it does mean to them money that might be generated, new new sources, new resources, maybe revenue is a, is a word that is a problem there, but it, almost all books are looking for leaders who can help bring in more fiscal resources. One way is state apportionment. We already know about that. You mentioned that well when you talk about maximizing, you know, the new formula. Another way, yes, is foundations and donors. Another way is grants. Another way is uh, partnerships of resources. So maybe resources is a better term that you might like better. But usually boards want creative presidents who can find other ways to bring those resources to campus. And that's what that was trying to reflect. However, if that's not high on your priorities, then yes, then you, then you should take it out. But that's, that's the message that I was trying to convey for you, again, reflecting what I was hearing from people. But I, I, I don't, I think, I don't it, think those are revenue. I mean, I, you like the word resources. Okay, you don't Re think resources. Resources may be a better word? Yeah. Resources works. Friendly amendment. Okay, that's fine. I'm um, trying to cut to the chase here. Yeah, yeah. Any, any other comments? Well, the last thing that I have also commented on really is, are we emphasizing enough the significance and importance and um, time-consuming element of working with the foundation? Uh, last time that was one of our three major job descriptions, and it's not now, it's only two. Um, it's lumped under community leader, and to me, the foundation is not uh, is distinct from that, and is a distinct distinct um, job, in effect, for the president, uh, particularly at this college, and much more so at this college than many. So I had suggested a category that basically takes out number nine as a standalone and calls it and a skilled fundraiser who works closely with the foundation so that it is more obvious that this is really a significant part of the job. You know, I, if I were an applicant for this job, one of the first things I'd do, of course, is read this document. Second thing I'd want to do is go to the video of this meeting and hear what we said we meant by it. And, and I think it's going to be crystal clear. I, I'm not concerned about that. I agree. Any other suggestions, comments? Can we have a, are we ready to vote? I, first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Kenny if he has a, an advisory vote. I, I read through the document and I think it's proper. Even though I, I don't see any reason why we should add um, having financial Capabilities as a preferred qualification because it's already listed at number two, but it's fine if that would push the vote further. So, w w I didn't hear the last part. Would you would you still vote for the uh, the motion? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all those. Do we have to have a roll call, or do, can just, we? No, just it, all those. No, and, but I just. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, I was going to ask. I mean. Uh, the the motion was for the the existing document. Uh, are we as amended? As amended. As okay. amended. Yes. So um, and maybe 
Trustee Haslam wants to clarify those amendments again. But well, we have two amendments. We've added a fourth item to, I have to go back to where we were, to uh, the preferred qualifications. Uh, a very simple statement that, uh, uh, that Pam will craft or did craft, and I don't remember exactly About the words, but they seemed financial acceptable management. to us. Still the financial management. And yeah, the, uh, we'll the second that. change was substituting the word resources for the word revenue. Okay. And then under minimum qualms, there was one to put the language. Yeah, it, for for uh, Ms. Reyes-Martin to take a look and make sure we're matching in all places. Actually, we're not at all matching our policy on protected classes. There's a lot more categories. So I, you know, I'm not quite sure how we handle that difference. Even just in gender, we have gender, gender identity, and gender expression. But we have other things like, I don't think appear here, like medical condition, genetic information. Um, what, what do we actually need to put in, right? Yeah. Well, that's that was my over, over, that's, that's over board. Board. Yeah. That's why yeah. I think Veronica went in a broader direction. Right. But if you, I mean, yeah, that it wasn't to eliminate or get rid of highlighting one. It was that, wow, there are California Community College students. And we are lucky enough to serve the top 100% of the whole population that wants to take advantage of our mission. And that makes for a complex statement that would encompass all of it. So. I guess my, my comment to that point is that even if Mickey's little hand gets all the way to the nine and the big hand gets to the 12, we will still not have a perfect document. Well, and as long as we're point, within, we just, I'm satisfied. We're within the statue, and it covers it. It's fine. But it, you know, like you said, I, I mean, we do have a policy, and you highlighted one, and that was great I, to I add. But okay. if we're good, then we're good. Means. I really do. So we're the third change is we're adding the word gender after gender identity. Correct. Okay. So all those in favor with those uh, the motion with those three changes. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Well, thank you. We will get to work on it right away. I will work with both uh, Marcia and Luz to make sure we get this accurate. And then I think Luz can speak to this, but I think the goal is to have the website go live by next Monday so that we can start directing people to it. Is that correct, Luz? I'm coming up. Uh, yes, so we have uh, prepared the website in the new uh, web design, which will be nice. Um, so we will finalize all of this and get it ready to go so it can be live on Monday. Thank you, uh, Pamela, and thank you, Luz. And thank you, Luz, because this was a vote of confidence on you because we approved something that we have not seen. So this is your writing <laughs> on just your great work. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you all, and thanks for all the input, Then You were really good about responding to me quickly. I heard from a lot of you, and I appreciated that. That definitely helped. Okay, now we're going to move to item 6.3, student trustee uh, privileges. It's an item that we discussed at our last uh, meeting. And I think just by clarification, <laughs> um, we had, I think, some little bit of confusion about what we could do and what we were doing. It, my understanding is that um, because we missed the deadline of May 15th to make any changes, any f additional changes or any changes that we would make beyond what we adopted at the last board meeting, which was to accept the, the board policy for student trustees uh, as it has been, any changes in the future would, would not take effect until next May 15. So we need, if we're going to make changes or consider that, we need to do that at a point in time that would, that would be sufficiently in advance so that it can go then, go through the, the process that, that, uh, that the college has for adopting uh, uh, new board policies or amending board policies, in other words, go to BPAC and uh, be considered there. So tonight w w is a discussion item to consider some suggestions that Trustee Ibeshi has uh, provided us, and that is the nature of our uh, discussion in the evening. 
I guess I would ask Trustee Abeshi to yeah. tell us the, <laughs> the items that he would like to see uh, changed. Oh. And if before he, if I yes. could just give some background on why we put all of this information in your packet, just so you could see the universe of what's out there on student trustee, including what the Ed Code says, what CCLC recommends um, the, on the perspectives document, and then in the student trustee chapter eight, I want to point something out to you that I think is important. The document, it's the next, it's right before Kenny's uh, recommendations for changing. But on the last page of that, on page um, 35, I don't know if you had an opportunity to look at it, of the chapter eight, the, the section that says chapter eight, there's a listing of district practices that shows you all the privileges that are allowed by all the, uh, the well, the community colleges that responded anyway, what they allow the student trustee to do, just so you have the full context. It, it, gives, a, it gives a listing of how many for each, for each uh, privilege that we can grant, it, it gives a listing of how many districts have adopted it. I think it'd be a- Or not. Or not, yeah. So just additional information. Sorry, which document is that? It's, uh, it says chapter eight. It says chapter eight. Chapter eight. The student oh, trustee, that one. That. We have this. It has this a, yeah, no, no, it's the same one. I just opened it. Oh, so it just has a which number. Do we, which one do we open? Yeah. And then you go to the second to the last page. Is it that one? The oh, okay. last page where it says district practices. Right. It tells you what all the other okay. districts do. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I would love to start by thanking all the board members. Um, it's been a very long journey from when I got elected as interim till now. I've learned so much, and it's been like a roller coaster just experiencing everything on the board of trustees. And one of my main goals coming into this position as a student trustee was to look at the position and try to understand why we have a student on the board and how we could make that student very, very effective. It's really not been easy wrapping my head around all the, all the information that has been presented to us on the board. But I, I, I made some changes to the Ed Code, to the, to the board policy 2015, which has, <laughs> which, has not been, <laughs> which has not been reviewed since 2016. So I thought to myself it would be proper we have this discussion and try to update uh, this board policy. One of the main sections I looked at with um, other members of the student government was attending closed sessions. I know this has been brought up to the board before and there's been a lot of discussions about it. But we came to the conclusion that we could have a case by case basis where students could be voted to be allowed into those closed sessions. I understand that according to the Ed Code, I'm not allowed into closed sections where employee matters or quality bargaining uh, are discussed. But there are other closed sections, like the one you have today concerning Don Lee, who was a former student. Unfortunately, I won't be allowed into that closed session, but this involves a student. And we have a closed section issue today that con concerns um, the former student trustee, and unfortunately, I won't be allowed into those closed sessions. So I believe there are some closed sessions where the student trustee should be allowed on a case-by-case -case basis where the board members seems fit that the students can give background or information where you could understand issues that concern those matters, not on all closed sessions. And also, I, um, Trustee Nielsen brought to my knowledge about the compensation I receive. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I thought about it and it's, it's like, it's not something I'm demanding from the board, but something I'm asking that you look into. I get $200 stipend, which is fine for me, but something we'll be considering on the student government um, last semester was what keeps students away from serving in school we have students having like two jobs and taking 15 credit load of classes. This is, this, this 
stop students from serving on the student government or serving in positions as a student trustee position. So if we could increase compensation to reduce the inequality, we would see we have more students trying to serve since they, would, they wouldn't have to have work as much jobs as they have to work right now. Since they have like, let's say $100 stipend, it will be fine. So I don't know if I've been able to pass, but if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you. And you're also asking for the right to make uh, motions? Yes. And sec that's, yes. That's another one, okay. Yeah. Any uh, trustee about? No, thank you, Kenny, for taking the initiative and actually getting us an exit, like a you know, proposal for us to consider. Talked us a lot about, but this is the first time we've actually had it, so this is really great. One thing that I would want to recommend that I know CCLC recommends in their board chair workshop is to have the student trustee advisory vote go first. I don't know if we want to put that here, saying that yeah. they shall they have an advisory vote that they get to cast before the board votes, or if we want to put that in another policy, but maybe mm -hmm. this is where we could start off putting it on. And actually, in, in reading uh, Kenny's proposal, it, that, that's what caused me to ask for his advisory vote uh, before mm -hmm. we voted on the profile, yeah, because yeah. I thought that was, the, that was the first. When I thought about that, I thought, well, it doesn't do any good to ask for an advisory vote mm -hmm. afterwards, so if you're going to have it, that's when it ought to be exercised. I, yeah, I, I would agree. I agree. It formalizes it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I, I would think, I would think it would be optional. I mean, I would think that it's, sometimes it's you might already, say, I "No, I, I don't want to give an optional vote." I mean, that, that, but the option should be yours. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with yeah. that. Yeah, you don't have to offer it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we've had student trustees say, "Oh no, I'll, I'll wait to give my yeah. comment," or it, I just I recall yeah. something that for, for yeah, yeah. So that's good. Any other? Good? Yeah. Any so, other comments? Um, can I move this over to BPAP? I don't understand what's the next step I need to... Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Chris, Trustee Kroenger. Um, well, I, I was gonna ask you, Kenny, the, the discussion we have here about the role of student trustees and perspectives. Um, we have not, to my knowledge, really explored that issue as to the purpose of the student trustee. And I'm wondering what your view of that is. Is it a representation of students closer to the ASG role, or is it a um, more of a general trustee role yeah. with looking out for the institution as a whole? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of, when, when I was told to come in as interim and I asked questions from my advisors and other people who have been in this position, one of the main goals of the student trustee I got to find out was the student trustee acts as the voice of all the students in school. So when I sit down here, I am not bringing in my own opinions, but what the larger population of the other students in school would say to the board if they were here. So I think that was one of the main goals why you should have a student trustee on the board to bring that student perspective. And that's what I've been trying to do. Okay, so you're opting for the representative of the views of all students yeah. as the perspective yeah. on the role of the student trustee. Yeah. Um, okay. I, the other thing I note is that most of the districts do not have students attend closed sessions, um, but a few of them uh, do um, basically on a case-by-case -case basis. To me, that is about as far as I'm comfortable with. I mean, we've had a huge, you're a great student trustee. We have had a real range of student trustees in the time period I've been on the board. And so to make the decision at the time seems to me to fit best with um, that situation, basically. I mean, <laughs> it's not that I, wouldn't encourage you to be able to come where it makes sense, but I think that what that situation is needs to be thought about at the time. Trustee Parker. Um, I'll get a little bit specific here and say that my suggestion would be in the bullet on attending closed sessions that where it ends with collective bargaining matters that we put a comma there and then match the EDCO language, which is comma at the discretion of the governing board. 
period. But it's also personnel, right? Uh, that's before that, yeah. So yeah. personnel matters or collective bargaining yeah. matters, which we, which well, we yeah. wouldn't, so comma, offset that. So it is essentially the whole thing would read, the student trustee may attend closed sessions, comma, except for closed sessions on personnel matters or collective bargaining matters, comma, at the discretion of the governing board. Okay, so you're doing that case by case thing, yeah. not saying anything contrary to the personnel. I mean, Correct. we have no discretion on no, personnel. No and, discretion and, on yeah. that. Okay. My other suggestion would be two bullets down where it says, um, well, actually the next bullet down, we, ha we say that the term of the student trustee shall be for one year beginning June 1st, whereas Ed Code says it's one year beginning May 15th. Um, and so question mark to me is do we need to have that align with Ed Code? It does need to. So change Make June change. 1st to May 15. Um, and then in the bullet point down um, where it says the student member shall be entitled to compensation of 50%, we um, frankly, our, our stipend is so low that uh, I completely agree with Trustee Igbechi, and I would say that we would, should simply eliminate compensation of 50% of and cut it to entitled to the total monthly meeting compensation received by the regularly elected members. Um, and those were my only suggestions. My, my concern about the at, dis, at the discretion of the governing board language is that each and every time we have a closed session, then we have to take up a separate topic to discuss the issue, which I guess we can do, but it just... Uh, I think we should do. I, I think we should. I think we but should. I mean, what, what I'm getting at, I, I, I mean, I think we ought to think about whether we want to either uh, uh, grant the privilege or not grant the privilege, yeah. as opposed to doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. Have to do, I mean, the Ed Code, I'm, gives us, Ed Code gives us language that says their student trustees cannot participate in closed sessions related to collective bargaining or personnel matters. Right. And, and by the way, I think high percentage of our closed sessions are those, are yeah. those categories. So maybe, think, maybe, yeah. maybe it's not as big a problem think, as I'm suggesting. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I could see maybe talking about, um, you know, land use, for, for example, property purchases. Yeah. But I think uh, Trustee Betchy made a good point in that there might be a student issue um, that it would be appropriate uh, to get input on, mm. um, but there may be student issues that are n totally not appropriate I think, to I get think student as, input I, on. I, well, this is probably a bigger discussion, but I think on a lot of student issues, student-related uh, issues, it probably won't be appropriate mm -hmm. for the student trustee to be there. I think it puts the student trustee in a difficult position because the student trustee is there uh, as a decision maker, as opposed to advisor, uh, what's well, advisory? Yeah. Um, but that gets down to the to um, you know. Then we need to start parsing out. Yeah. You know, which ones discipline? No. I mean, we'd need to add more no's. I think yeah. it's okay just to deal okay. with it on a case by case. Trustee Miller, you made me think because I was like, yeah, I, I'm like, you know, I was like, let's get a financially savvy guy in here, gal, and get your $400 a month and, you know, as a, it's just like an internship, you know, you're learning. Anyway, so I'm totally fine with that. But you just made me think, it is going to add a layer of bureaucracy because how do you yeah. determine, because you can't talk about it, and so how are you going to determine that when the agenda's noticed? Oh, There's I, just I no, know. how I think, would you determine that? Well, I think the threshold is you're going to have a closed session. Legal counsel can say whether any of the elements in the closed session are not within the prohibited category of personnel or collective bargaining. Clearly we've got, uh, as far as I know, everything today is, is not eligible. Um, and then if something is eligible, you can say it's, it's eligible. Who, who can say? Put it say? on the agenda. Oh, to have it. Yeah, put it on the agenda for, you know, somewhere before closed session. On this one, with all respect to Kenny, I, I, I was tracking, I mean, I was like, give him, you know, I remember last time I was like, what's the big deal? Give him what he wants, he's a student. But on this one, I see, I think I see what you're saying, and just from a, like, technical, I'm looking at Angie with posting the agenda, checking with legal, and, and then how closed sessions can change <coughs> depending on whatever, I mean, we don't even know what we know until we get there, 
and to, well, because nobody tells us. But we're not going to decide. That's why I'm saying. No, I know, but then it's not at the discretion of the board. It's at the discretion of council. So now we're no. delegating that no, no. to council? I'm, no, no. I'm saying council will say these five items aren't even eligible. But we do have one that is eligible. Put the one that's eligible on the board's yeah. agenda, and the board can say yes or no. I don't think it's going to happen very often. I, I had a hard time thinking of non-personnel, non-collective bargaining closed session items. And I would also think that it's a very awkward situation for a student to be involved in a student discipline situation. I mean, we have to report out our votes. I assume the vote would also, the advisory vote is reported out as well. That's, that's a hard thing. Trustee Abu. I, I agree with Marcia. Um, if you go and look at the Brown Act and what's even allowed to be in closed session, there's only two that aren't personnel collective bargaining and that's purchasing property or security issues okay that really fit the bill so and then pending litigation might, might. not be personnel or collective bargaining so it's 2.5 okay and those first two never really happened yeah. thank yeah, you I mean my, that, that was my only example was pending litigation on on uh, the Garvin um, because it was a contractor dispute and I don't think that implicated um, either of those two but right. trustee Nielsen yeah, that was right. long ago I give this quite a bit of thought. Even I know I missed a meeting recently, but it wasn't about this topic. And I thought about, because I sit next to our student trustee, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And one of the, one of the, one of the viewpoints I go to um, that, I, that I pick up and then pursue so that I can understand things from different points of view is um, <clears throat> try to think of why did we select the policies we selected in the past? And then I try, and I'm, I'm sure there's, there's hardly, maybe once something came up that we talked about, and I can remember since I've been on this board that wasn't, that, that would have allowed a student trustee, and there might have been another issue, but I couldn't think of even one where it was, that was the sole purpose of the meeting. When I did think of one little thing, I thought it was only like one of the items on the meeting, and it was brief, and then I, and as soon as you start talking about any of these other categories, which is mostly why we're in, in closed session is because it shouldn't be aired, um, it, we're, we, we wouldn't be out of line to just leave it the way it is and not to go there. That way we can't make, a mistake cannot be made. So I, I'm, I was interested in everything, all the points that were brought up here, and I see no problem with a student trustee being on matters that, but if, if it's those kind of matters, then why are we in closed session? Um, that's why there's very, very few of those instances. So I don't really see it as a big point, and I, I know it's a mystery to you because you're not in there, but it's really not. <laughs> you you don't, don't, and for the most part, we don't want to be there. <laughs> I, I and that's the, that's the truth. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> it doesn't come up as often, but in those cases, in those, in those rare cases where it comes up, I think I should be allowed. Yeah. Especially security, yeah. I think is an interesting one. Well, I, I did not anticipate we'd be making a decision yeah. tonight, but this is a good discussion, and uh, I think it makes us better positioned to deal with the issue expeditiously when we get to it next year. Trustee Abood. Is this now going to go to BPAP? No, 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 because no. we're not making. Oh, it's not BPAP's decision. We're not voting on anything right now. We're not going to vote until. Um, well, you can you can make your the changes that you made today. You can present those to BPAP. BPAP will review them, and then they will come back to you for further discussion. Mm -hmm. So we could do it because now. BPAP. BFAP just may, may, may make some recommendations yeah. to you, too, and so you're going to have to take yeah. all those into consideration. Well, Angie's right. I mean, we could, we could uh, it, it won't take effect until, right. regardless of what Correct. BPAC does, it Correct. wouldn't take effect until next May 15th, but we could, if somebody wants to make a motion, we could do it. Well, you it's don't need a motion. You don't need a motion. You don't need a motion. You don't need a motion. We can incorporate them, bring them back to you next time so you can right. make sure we got the change. Yeah, we can look at it again. And yep. then it can right. go to sure. BPAP. Yeah. So that, is, can, that is exactly our process. The mm -hmm. board discusses first. If the board has a general sense of going forward, then it goes to BPAP, yeah. then it comes back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but we're going to bring it back so you can 
vote on. Make sure we have the changes right, right. and then send it to the people. Yeah. Okay. So it, can it go, because I'm kind of with Craig to just, that it, if it, it's so few that the student trustee can attend, just it's, leave it as it is no point. with the, because you don't want to risk making a mistake, giving extra work to, st I, I don't want to go through that. So I would, I, I would be okay with everything else you're requesting except for the closed session. I'd like to leave yeah. the closed session as is and just leave it very clean um, and not add more. I agree. There's just too much, yeah, there's too much risk I, I of missing sense, something. I hear a sense of the board that they would like to incorporate a change to the closed session item. Is, is, right, is, right, so I'm saying can we, can both those, can that go to BPIP as both? Like we can do either or the board is like, so that they then can. Then we have to vote on that. I, I think so then should, we would just think, vote no when it comes. Yeah, I think it. we should think, you guys, if you haven't thought about it, you should think about the risk of an error. You yeah. really should consider that there are reasons the policy was written and adopted the way it is, and very few other places do differently. So maybe do a little more homework before you just advocate for a change that wouldn't be um, yeah. normal. I, Trustee Haslam. I, <clears throat> I agree completely with, with Craig. Uh, this has been a, a really interesting discussion, and I, for one, would like to think about it a little more. I'm wondering if, uh, particularly on the closed session piece, whether we have to say anything that is different. But if at some future point we, we wanted, and the student trustee wanted to participate in a particular item, I, I, I believe we, we do have the authority to include the student trustee even as it is. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not because, no, we'd have, because we include other people. No, we, there's an ed code provision about it, so you can't, you have to decide annually what privileges you're going yeah. to give the student. So is there by a, I, well, I'd, I'd certainly like to have legal counsel weigh in on that because it seems to me that's not a privilege. If we wanted to have a, oh. an expert witness come in, we'd, we'd call that expert witness. But they specifically call out that they identify four okay. privileges you can grant. That's one of them, being able to go to a closed session and it says you, you must identify that by May 15th. So I don't. We, we, we can ask counsel, yeah. but I'm pretty. I've already asked him. I met with him. There you go. <laughs> so I could make sure I had it right. But so, we can, I can get So get are, are you team. saying that if we wanted a particular student, not the trustee, but somebody else to come into a closed session to participate with us, we couldn't do that? I no. guess you could, but you couldn't let the student trustee do it unless it's been approved in the year that you're going to do it. Hmm because it has to be done annually. You have to approve the privileges annually. Okay. All right, well, I, I, I want to express my appreciation to Kenny for bringing it, uh, because it's obvious this, is, this may not apply to you. It, it applies to student trustees, and I think yes. many of us would be more eager if we could have you as a trustee for the rest of our terms of office on this. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are doing a, a really fine job. Do you need a second for that, Trustee Hassel? Okay. Uh, I think third and a fourth and a seventh. So uh, I, I need a sense of what we want to have prepared for the next <coughs> meeting if we're going to take some action on it. And so I guess my question is, are you going to want these um, suggestions incorporated into a document and brought back to another meeting or would you like it to, that, yes. to be incorporated presented to BPAP and have their input no on no it? we we, we want to we need to make a decision ourselves first and, and and so the the issue we haven't decided on is closed session so I, I my suggestion would be we could we could have it a, a um, proposal that incorporates uh, the closed session permission, I think with Kate Parker's suggestion at the discretion, comma, at the discretion of the board. Okay. And then we can decide. Okay. So do you, would you like that at uh, July, in July or August? Uh, yes. It, what, whenever. Next time's probably good. July? It'll still be fresh, okay. in, our, uh, right. fresh in our minds. So yeah. August. <laughs> Oh, July. You're talking about July, right? Because we're a bit, we, isn't? 
There's only yeah. Make it like August. A long meeting. Okay, we'll do it uh, uh, the first meeting in August. Okay. I don't right. know the future, but I just feel like July because everybody keeps saying next meeting, next meeting. <laughs> first week in August is good. Yeah, we're looking forward still to our our presentation on um, uh, guided pathways that's and AB seven hundred five. Yes. So all right, yeah. that's a long all meeting. Right. Okay, I think we um, are now to the item that where we move into closed session. Good, thank you. Motion to adjourn to closed session. Do, we, do I hear a motion? <laughs> yes, motion to adjourn to closed session. Do I hear a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye.